the heart of America's business life. It's here in New York, financial capital of the world, and home of the 2005 NFL Draft. There they are, the commodities. If value's what you're after, you better pick me. I put in the work already. You just gotta call my name. You don't have to wait for me to mature. I already have. The stats, the strong indicators, the special qualities. Quick. Hands. Strength. Experts monitored them. Analysts broke them down. The prospects, soon to be pros. These are investors with options. There's a high risk involved. I feel there are no risks in drafting me. You have to do your homework. I work 24 hours a day. You put a few dollars down and bang, you got something big in return. I'm good for the long term with guaranteed returns. All that's left for them to do is decide and hope they make the right choice. The NFL Draft is all about business. And for the next two days, it's the only game in town. Welcome to ESPN's coverage of the 2005 NFL Draft, presented by Coors Light. In many ways, it's the first game to be played in the NFL since February. And boy, are people ready. All the stock market may be closed, but I think all the action's right here at the 2005 NFL Draft in a new stadium, if you will, the Jacob Javits Center on the west side of Manhattan. And some of the best players are here with us in New York. Alex Smith, will this be his moment? Quarterback Aaron Rodgers of Cal. Or will it be the wide receivers day? Braylon Edwards, we got a half a dozen players here. We got tons of players on pins and needles all around America on this. The opening gavel of the 19 of the 2005 and the 70th annual National Football League selection meeting, commonly known as the draft. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Berman. Glad you could be with us. Chris Mortensen is the H-back to my right. Good to be here, Chris. <laughs> it's Christmas every day, but when Mel gets to the draft, Mel Kuyper Jr. See it up, Boomer. A favorite here, see? They love you. And six years ago, he was in this bus. First time we've ever had a, a player in the National Football League with us. Six years ago, in 1999, the sixth pick overall, the St. Louis Rams, Tory Holt. Welcome, Tory. Thank you. Welcome Thank you. Thank Thanks you for having me. Do you have anything else to do? I have nothing else to do. I'm, I'm, I'm reliving my, my, my time in New York. I, I would have loved to have been here when I got drafted in, in 90, uh, 98. Sixth pick to the Rams. But it, unfortunately, I wasn't here. So now I'm back doing a little work. So having fun, man. It's You're going to live here. it like they're going to live it, though, today. Right. I, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little nervous, man. I don't, these guys, man, they, their lives are about to change dramatically right here today. Well, we're anxious uh, to hear your commentary and your thoughts and, and just take us through the process, which wasn't so very long, although you were last century. You're old news. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly old news is not what the 49ers are doing. Their news usually is picking very late for the last two decades. They have been the model franchise of the National Football League. However, this past year, not so well. 2-14, and 14, they've been on the clock since the end of the regular season. Mike Nolan, the new head coach, where do they start building? Well, they have a dozen picks, including the first one overall. Well, is it Alex Smith? Well, is it Aaron Rodgers quarterback? Well, do they trade? So a lot of this has changed. Are they negotiating with three at once for the update? Let's get an early morning West Coast scone, which we will do that in a moment. But Alex Smith, is he head and shoulders? Is this what they should do? It's not head and shoulders, boom, but I think what he is is the top quarterback in this draft. You look at Alex Smith, I think separation from Aaron Rodgers, not that much. The 49ers need a quarterback. They define Alex Smith as their guy. You have to bring him into the fold. You look at Alex Smith. I made this statement for the last couple months. Smartest player, forget just quarterback, smartest player overall to go from college to the National Football League, graduated in two years. Remember, only 20 years of age, doesn't turn 21 until May 7th processes information quickly. That's why John Gruden was so high on Alex Smith throughout this process. You look at a guy who's accurate, does not make mistakes. 101, 21 consecutive passes without an interception this year, 108 consecutive passes without a pick in 2002. This is a kid who understands how to manage a game and not turn the football over. 
Well, we shall see if it's Alec. Remember what happened last year at this time. So what is San Francisco thinking about at this moment? It's just past 9 o'clock out on the West Coast for an early morning scone and cappuccino. Let's go out to Sal Palantonio at, I believe I remember the address, 4949 Centennial Boulevard. Sal? Good morning, Chris. This was the draft scene right now in the draft room of the 49ers a few minutes ago. Mike Nolan checking his watch, knows that he's on the clock, and he's got to make a pick, and they've got to make a decision. Now, here's what the latest from the 49ers draft room. They are deciding what to do with this pick. Do they trade it? They've fielded a number of calls from different teams. Teams are right now interested in moving up, and the Niners have fielded a bunch of calls, and they've said to themselves, none of these picks right now that they've been offered are good enough for them to move out of the number one spot. So, as expected, if they sit there, Alex Smith of Utah would be their pick. Then things get very interesting, Boomer. What do they do with Alex Smith if they take him? Do they trade him perhaps to Miami, Tampa Bay, or Cleveland? So it could be high drama right down to the finish, Boom. All right, Sal. So, well, we'll obviously see. We went through this scenario last year when uh, San Diego kept the pick, chose Eli Manning. We had that rare photo op with Eli with the Chargers jersey. And then, of course, within the hour, the trade was made, and Eli was on his way to the New York Giants, and Phillip Rivers was on the other way. So we heard Sal mention the teams, Mort. What's happening right now? Well, listen, you said Merry Christmas in the mail. Don't forget, on NFL Draft Day, it's also April Fool's Day. And Mike Nolan, the head coach of the San Francisco 49ers, is simply playing the game. He doesn't have Alex Smith signed. So, therefore, you go ahead and you use the time on the clock. You make sure nobody offers you a Herschel Walker-type deal. But the bottom line, at some point, you have to tell your fans, this is our guy, and I really believe, in the end, it's going to be Alex Smith, and he, Mel, is Boomer, is the right guy. Well, but there is a big, right, Mel, there are six, seven different opinions on who might be ranked number one. What do you have? This year may be like, and you look about going back 25, 30 years, unlike any other in terms of fluid boards, nobody agreeing, no consensus, no defined, clear-cut number one. My guy, Mike Williams, did not even play football this year, sat out the year, but in 2002 and 2003, he dominated the Pac-10. His average per catch for his career, better than Braylon Edwards. You talk about speed, he's got enough. Ronnie Brown, you look at a complete football player. Didn't start, but he did in 2002 when Cadillac was hurt, and he put up big numbers. He can run, he can catch, and he can block, he can do it all. Braylon Edwards, we talked about. He's the consensus number one guy. Fuck people in the NFL and the media. He's got size, competitive. What he has to do is eliminate those costly drops. Just go back to the Ohio State game for proof positive of that. You look at Cadillac Williams, you look at a guy who is a passionate football player, improved dramatically junior to senior year as a pass receiver out of the backfield, excellent between the tackles. Cedric Benson, complete back, Ronnie Brown, don't forget Cedric. This is a kid, red zone runner, initial defender, never brings him down. This is a kid whose body of work, total body of work in Texas, outstanding. I know about the comparisons of Ricky Williams, I think they're unfair. Six, Alex Smith. You know about a quarterback, not number one on the board, but if the 49ers define him number one, he's my number one quarterback. Gets smart, accurate, mobile, and only 20 years of age. Go to the number seven overall, you go to Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers at Cal. Like I said, separation, I got one six and one seven. So if Aaron Rodgers drops, not because of ability, I know he's a little mechanical. Aaron debates that with me all the time, but he is a guy who does not let the ball at the ground much. He's accurate. He steps up hard in that pocket. He doesn't back off. He's tough. I like Aaron Rodgers a lot, and somebody's going to get themselves a heck of a steal if he falls down the board a bit. You came out of the garage in fifth gear, you know that? <laughs> You're unbelievable. It is Christmas. For, let, let, let's kind of put a bow about what we're going to see here today. We are probably, if it is Alex Smith, going to have the fifth straight year in which a quarterback is going to be drafted number one. You talked about those running backs. You saw Mel uh, identify several of them. We're going to have probably three go in the top seven or eight. Remember, we haven't had a running back go in the top ten since LaDainian Tomlinson in 2001, so that's a little different. There are a couple other wide receivers, two that Mel mentioned, and there are three bona fide top corners, not to mention Minnesota playoff team, San Diego playoff team, Dallas and Washington, hopeful playoff teams. Those four teams have two first round picks we'll open it up when we return to new york the 2005 nfl draft about to kick off
to the following presentation of the National Football League. Welcome back to New York, our new site of the draft, the Jacob Javits Center, but the site of the commissioner since 1989 to open the draft would be Paul Tagliabue. He has the honors once again to kick things off. Good afternoon to uh, football fans here and around the nation. Welcome to the uh, Jacob Javits Convention huh? Center in New York City and to the 2005 National Football League College Draft. The first selection in the 2005 NFL Draft belongs to the San Francisco 49ers, who are now on the clock. Well, we're official. The 49ers are on the clock, which they essentially have been since the end of last season. They have not since the common draft had the first pick overall. They have it, and such an integral part of our NFL coverage week in, week out, month in, month out, is our Susie Kalber, who's with some of the top players in the nation. Sue's in the green room. Hi. Uh, hi, Chris, and thank you. Alex Smith has been on the NFL roller coaster ride. What was the first thought that went through your head when you woke up this morning? I think just how fortunate I am. Um, you know, this has been a dream of mine ever since I was a little kid. Uh, you know, dream of everyone. And, and to be able to be here and, and actually be a part of this is, is truly amazing. And, uh, you know, I'm, I've just been really blessed, so. Between last night and this morning, what have you and your agent, Tom Condon, heard from the Niners? It's tough. I actually spoke to Coach Nolan last night. Um, you know, we didn't specifically talk about anything, but it was a positive conversation, and, and I feel good about it. Um, obviously, I, I, I love the coaching staff of San Francisco, and it, it would be a great honor to, you know, to be their selection, but who knows? What did he say? I just kind of checking on me, seeing how I was going, asking him, you know, uh, how I was doing and how this all was uh, treating me, so. How much control do you feel you have in all of this? I, I, I feel like I don't. I mean, this isn't the recruiting process. They're making the decision. You know, obviously, I, I hope I've, um, you know, shown what kind of person I am, what kind of quarterback I am, and what I'm going to do in the future. And hopefully, uh, they, they've seen that in me, so. What are your feelings about trying to get a deal done, get signed? Oh, absolutely. That, that is uh, very important to, me, important to me to get into camp, I think, to get to work. As much fun as this draft stuff might seem, uh, I, I'm ready to get to work. I'm ready to be part of a team, um, you know, and, and really get some stuff done. So. And what's going on inside your stomach right now? I'm anxious. <laughs> I, I'm really anxious and excited. I, I've been waiting for this day uh, my whole life, dreaming about it, and it, it's here, and I'm just trying to take it in. So. Enjoy the ride. Thank you very much. Chris. Susie, Alex, thank you very much. And you can understand why a young man would say, oh, I don't want to get to work. He finished college in, what, two and a half years. He's not even 21 until May. He can't even rent a car in the state of Utah uh, until he turns 21, and yet he could buy a couple cars if and when he gets signed. So you can understand why he would not want to sit out. But yet, Mel, it's just interesting. I'm just going to go to our publication, the <laughs> our Bible all the time, the Mel Kuyper draft report coming out later and later every year, I might add. Thanks, Mel. <laughs> You have a guy that didn't even play last year, number one. What gives? Uh, you have a decision to make when you rate players. Because you say, okay, who's the guy that's going to be number one on your board? And I looked at it and I said, okay, see some question marks with some of the guys below him. And you look at a guy like Mike Williams. Had he played this year, it would have been a spectacular season with Leinert and company. And I think he would have been the clear-cut number one. This is a kid who averaged more yards per catch, 14-7 to 14-1 over Braylon Edwards. Had 95 receptions in 2003. The same year, Kerry Colbert had 69. Kerry Colbert was a second-round pick. A real good job in Carolina this past year. I really like Mike Williams. I think this is a kid who's going to be uncoverable because of the situation in the NFL with the rules, limit the physical ability of a cornerback to be physical. I look at Mike Williams as a guy who I think can come in without pressure because he's going to go probably down the line just a bit. Certainly not going to be one, two, or three overall. And I think he's going to be a heck of a player and he's going to be a steal. But on my board, and I'm one of the 32, on the 49ers board, the number one player should be Alex Smith. Well, that's another story we'll be following. Mike Williams didn't play at all last year, and so we, therefore we know he's fresh. We know he's, he's fresh. fresh. He take a lot of hits. But how fresh is he going to be? Well, the first pick is fresh. The 49ers, they're probably entertaining the phones out there in Santa Clara, California. But the Niners set to start their way back up. We'll be back. Size, intelligence, my arm. Alex Smith will score! Touchdown, Utah! If value's what you're after, you better pick me. Thank you. 
We are back at the NFL draft. He was a third round pick in 79 and starting in 1981, forever changed the face of the San Francisco 49ers and frankly the face of the Vince Lombardi trophy, Joe Montana. And the reins eventually went from Hall of Famer Joe Montana to this year's inductee, our own Steve Young. For two decades, with and without helmets, the 49ers were either at the top or very near the top. But since 99 and on, 10 win seasons dwindled all the way down to 2 and 14 last year. Hence a change in the coaching ranks and hence a change in what the 49ers, the model franchise, for a long time, now they start to build from what seemingly is the beginning. Mike Nolan is the new head coach. He certainly has a resume in the National Football League that begins well, with his father, Dick Nolan, who was head coach of some very good 49er teams in the 70s with John Brody, Gene Washington, Dave Wilcox, etc. They were playoff teams. So Mike was around those guys as a young man. He also has been around some pretty darn good coaching under Dan Reeves with the Broncos and Giants, Skins, Jets, Ravens. He's more than earned his stripes for this opportunity. That's right. And for a guy who's in his early 40s, Mike Nolan has been an NFL assistant for 17 years, and he's coached on the uh, offensive side of the ball as well, even though most of it's been on defense. And I think when John York, the team president of the 49ers, basically clean house at the end of the season he wanted a singular face and voice to lead them into a new era a rebirth so to speak Mike Nolan has the power he has the authority much like Bill Belichick has it in New England much like Andy Reid has it in Philadelphia and he is a meticulous guy a guy who is high on accountability and I've already heard about a lot of changes already under Mike Nolan in that organization well he knows what he wants he understands and, and, and he's making on, this pick they're onward and upward that by the way the Niners have 12 picks now the, the bad news is when you pick number one you had the worst season of anybody last year That's right the good news is you can talk to more than one player hey can we sign you so they've talked to Aaron Rodgers they've talked to Braylon Edwards in addition to Alex Smith who are some of these other guys that are going to go very quickly Mel? well Chris you hope to be able to get a deal done by draft day if possible but you can't let that dictate who you choose if you don't work out a deal so be it you're drafting a player and you're looking at the future not looking at this season no rookie quarterbacks going to come in here the Ben Roethlisberger's and Dan Marino's are hard to find guys are going to do it that quickly John Elway couldn't he's the greatest player I believe ever to play the game of football Braylon Edwards is there Certainly under consideration. You look at the second pick overall, the third pick overall. I wasn't as high on Braylon as some other people were. I think the drops were something that bothered me a bit. He is 6'3", 210, though, and I'll tell you what, he can go get the football in a crowd. He's a good football player. Aaron Rodgers, you know, you talk about a guy at a week and a half ago, looked like Aaron was going to be the guy. He said, oh, we'll have him signed maybe by the middle of next week, everybody thought. Then the audibleization back to Alex Smith. Aaron Rodgers is a good quarterback. He's going to be a fine quarterback in the NFL. Forget franchise quarterbacks. The only franchise quarterback perceived coming out of college who lived up to it in the NFL was John Elway. Coming out, Troy Aikman was not considered franchise. Tony Mandarich, everybody thought, should have gone number one. That really some people did. And certainly when you look back at all the different quarterbacks along the way, there wasn't a consensus, even on Peyton Manning. A lot of people thought Ryan Leaf was the guy. So forget the franchise. Aaron Rodgers will be solid. How far he drops is going to be the storyline of the day. But somebody's going to get themselves a fine, solid starting quarterback. He didn't get worse this week, you know. <laughs> okay. But that being said, look, okay, the Niners have been January, February, March, April. And five minutes and 31 seconds they got left to make their pick. Let's quickly go back out to Niners headquarters. Sal Palantonio, what do you hear under the door? Uh, Boomer, for the last 24 hours, Mike Nolan has been fielding calls for lots of different teams. There have been five specific teams in the mix, just to get you caught up, fill in the blanks on the trade talks. The two teams that have been interested to go up and get Braylon Edwards, Minnesota Vikings and Washington Redskins. Three teams interested in going up to number one to get Alex Smith would be the Miami Dolphins, Cleveland Browns, and Tampa Bay Bucks. So far, Nolan hasn't heard any kind of offer that he likes. They do have to restore the luster of this Tiffany franchise, as you said earlier, and the way to do that is to get multiple picks, but he hasn't ho heard an offer that he likes so far, and so they're sitting pretty right now and may take Alex Smith, Boomer. All right, Sal, well, we'll see. The Niners have 440 to go very quickly. Let me ask Torrey Holt. You you're too young. You don't remember when the Niners humbled the Rams 17 straight times. You came in in 99. You always beat the four, even though they were good then. You see them. They need help in a lot of places, don't they? They do. I, I mean, I've heard all the horror stories of when they smacked their butts around in, in, in St. Louis and in L.A. But if I'm drafting right now, I'm taking a quarterback. You're talking about rebuilding a, rebuilding a franchise, putting a new face on the franchise, and listening to, and hearing about Alex Smith. The guy has all the mechanics. The guy is a winner. 
He's a smart guy. He'll be tested quick to see how smart he is in the National Football League. But I will rebuild this franchise behind the quarterback. And Alex Smith, I think, right now is the top pick. And you know, we're, we're going to see. But Alex Smith is, is definitely should be the 49ers guy. Well, if you're a receiver, you got to have a quarterback. But I get that. It, and, and I. And I, and I say this, I say this, boom. If they take a a, a uh, receiver, who's going to get him the ball? From my understanding, Retay is hurt. It. I got it. So I'm I'm gonna start right now with with the quarterback, and then I'm gonna build my I'm gonna build my players around the quarterback and go from there. Well, we're getting close to the bewitching hour, if you will, the bewitching minute. Uh, Susie Calver back in the green room with a guy who was well a little bit of the center of last year in this very spot, uh, Sus. You're right. Tom Condon was Eli Manning's, well, is Eli Manning's agent as well, and Alex Smith. What are you hearing from the Niners? Well, I haven't heard anything now, Susie, for a day and a half. So, uh, but uh, nevertheless, I think that uh, Alex is in a great position. Um, I think the 49ers are, are considering him seriously, and I would be very surprised unless there's a blockbuster trade that uh, that Alex doesn't go to the 49ers. Well, what are you expecting beyond that? Could it be a similar situation? Pick a quarterback, number one, and then a trade? Uh, I wouldn't expect so. I think that uh, I think the 49ers want to take what they consider to be the best player. And, uh, and I think Alice fits, uh, fits that, that, that bit. Naturally, comparisons are made, but what is the biggest difference between this situation and the one that went down last year? Um, well, uh, you know, last year there was some uh, difficulty with regard to the team. And, uh, and, and this year, Alex is, uh, uh, he's happy. We've looked at all the top picks there. And uh, if, he's, if he's the San Francisco 49ers first pick, he's, uh, he'll be extraordinarily happy. And if not, then Miami and Cleveland and, and Tampa, all teams that look like they would uh, maybe be in the market are, are all very good options. We're going to find out right now. We are. Good. Chris. All right, Susie, Tom Condon, a uh, former very good lineman with the Kansas City Chiefs. But now, we'll see. Number one pick in the 2005 draft. The commissioner has the card. With the uh, first selection in the 2005 NFL draft, the San Francisco 49ers select Alex Smith, quarterback, Utah. Cleveland. Smith, a young man who I think, Mel, you, you know, high school and college, what, 45 and 5? Is this one loss record? That's a far cry to 2 and 14. You want a guy who's used to winning, you're trying to build winning. If indeed he stays right there and they get this done, and I, I, I think they will, not necessarily in the next 10 minutes, but I, I think they will. This will start the new feel for the foot. They picked the guy, they signed him. We're going to do things right. This will be a heck of a chance to make a statement. Big and little picture, I think. Well, you can talk about a winning quarterback, Chris. You mentioned high school, 25 and 1 over that two year period. You talk about a guy at Utah, what he did, leading them to an undefeated season, getting Steve Savoy and Paris Warren heavily involved. One thing about you look at a guy like Alex Smith in that shotgun for Urban Meyer, former head coach at Utah, Urban Meyer now with the Florida Gators. That's something adapting to being under center that he's going to have to work on in the National Football League, Mort. You know, when I've spoken with Mike Nolan, the 49ers coach, he has been Im ex implicit that the, this pick, the top pick of the draft, and the quarterback will be the face of the franchise probably even beyond how long Mike Nolan coaches. He could be the face of the franchise for 10 to 15 years, and that's a big factor. And what, look at the size. And I think that's something where he's filling out that six four and a half frame. And you look at a guy who's 217 pounds now, be 225 probably a year and a half from now. Look at the record. Look at what he's been able to do throughout his career, high school, college. He wins football games. He's the kind of kid only 20 years of age, mature beyond his years. As I said, and this cannot be understated, smartest player ever to go from college to pro processes information so quickly an offensive coordinator's dream because he's an extension of the coordinator of the head coach no mistakes are going to be made in translation with alex smith accuracy poise you look at the ability in terms of hey things break down he has mobility now he's not going to be michael vick but he did rush for almost 600 yards in that utah offense that spread the field so successfully and as i said you're going to see both the wide receivers at utah steve savoy and paris warren probably be selected in this process so you got a lot of guys involved in that offense it was a complex scheme and you look at Alex Smith he may not have been number one on my board but for the 49ers as an organization I thought he was the best quarterback in this draft slightly over Aaron Rodgers and that's the direction knowing the quarterback need the way it was that they had to go 
Well, and now the pattern continues. Five straight years, as we talked about, with the quarterback number one, Alex, joining Eli Manning last year, Carson Palmer the year before, David Carr the year before that, Michael Vick the year before that, and two years before that, Tim Couch, the year before that, Peyton Manning. So it wasn't always this way. The quarterbacks went one all the time, but seven of eight uh, have uh, the last, uh, the last, seven of the last eight number one picks have been quarterbacks. So, a relieved Alex Smith. <laughs> relieved very early with our Susie again. Susie <laughs> well, two and a half years ago, Alex Smith was a third string quarterback. What did it take to get here? You know, I'd be lying if I said I got here by myself. There's been a lot of great people around me, my family, my teammates, my coaches, um, you know, and friends. And uh, I worked really hard for this. I, I, I truly believe that. I, I came a long way. And, I'm just so thankful to be here, and, and uh, I'm ready to work, so. Everybody keeps talking about how smart. Well, you, you came to college with so many credits that you graduated in two years, but how does that translate into being a great quarterback and now NFL quarterback? I think just the habits help. You know, my preparation, the time I put in the film room, the time I put in on the practice field, understanding defenses, understanding schemes, and uh, I truly think that's going to help me at the next level, absolutely. What do you expect the journey is like from here? Oh, pretty crazy for the next few days, but I'm so excited to be part of this organization. Um, you know, ready to get to work. I truly believe they're heading in the right direction, and uh, it's great to be part of this. So, congratulations. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Chris, Susie, Alex, uh, congratulations. 1979, the Niners had the number one pick. If they had traded it away to Buffalo, who ended up choosing Tom Cousineau. So, 1954, Dave Parks, number one overall pick, San Francisco. 2005, Alex Smith, number one overall pick, San Francisco. ESPN's exclusive coverage of the NFL Draft is presented by Coors Light, the official beer sponsor of the NFL. And in part by the all-new midsize H3 in dealership soon. And Southwest Airlines, proud sponsor of the NFL and official airline of Super Bowl 40. That's all right. Well, look at that shot. There's Alex with a, with a smile that the proverbial could light up a room with family, friends. I mean, it's just, it's like a team photo up there. They're like 40 <laughs> folks, the Smith family and friends, and they made the trip, and it, it, they're just all happy. Are they as happy in San Francisco? I would have to think. Let's go out to Sal Palantonio with the new head coach. Sal? Thanks a lot, Boomer. Mike Nolan, uh, you made that first pick. It was right down to the wire. As you said, it would go. Why Alex Smith? Well, as we've said all along, with every pick today, and in particular the very first pick, we want, we want to pick guys that we want this football team to look like. Uh, and Alex Smith is what we want this football team to look like. He's very competitive. He's got leadership skills. Uh, he's a hard worker. Uh, he's very competitive. Um, with those things in mind, uh, that's, that's the primary reason. There's been rumors circulating that you might trade Alex Smith to another team. Will you keep him? We will keep Alex Smith. Yes, we will. What will you do in the rest of the draft now? Well, we'll continue, like I said, to identify the players that we want, that we feel we want our football team to look like. Uh, we'll continue on that path. Obviously, our next pick is the first pick in the second round, so it's pretty close to a one as we see it. Uh, that might be a pick that some other people are interested in at that point. It typically is, and that's why I say it. Year after year, that's still a lot of pick that people go after. And if they are, then we'll see if it's, if it's worth us to make a move. But we certainly have about four or five players in mind that if, uh, if they're there, you know, we, we might very well just stick with our guy. Now, Alex Smith is in New York. You got any message for your new quarterback? Well, as I asked him on the phone a minute ago, are you ready to go to work? And he assured me I'm ready to go to work. All right. Thanks a lot, Mike. Congratulations. Thank you. Back to you, Boomer. All right, Sal, Coach Nolan, thank you very much. And so, well, it doesn't say, it's not like we were sitting here at this time last year when the picture was taken, here's the Charger jersey, but that's not the way it's going to work out, or, or is it? Or no, Boomer, I think there's been a lot of speculation this could be a repeat of Eli Manning's scenario from a year ago. It's not. The camps for Braylon Edwards, the Michigan receiver, and for Aaron Rodgers, the Cal quarterback, got word this morning that it is Alex Smith and Alex Smith to keep. So I think the drama's over, and Mike Nolan is, in fact, does, in fact, have the quarterback that he wants. All right, so, Tori, so now you know you want him to take his time figuring out how to play quarterback. Don't right, you I, play him I, twice every year. I hope it takes him three or four <laughs> years to finally catch on. We have to see this guy twice a year. But like Coach said, a new coach. It's, it's a new coach. It's a new attitude. It's a new quarterback. A new face of the San Francisco 49ers. I think the 49er fans should be very happy, very pleased with this pick. And I'm sure Alex Smith will go in there and play very well. But I hope it takes him a minute, though. You know, I wonder if, and we, while we're right here with Miami on the clock, I wonder they have Tim Rattay off injured, but do you... 
does Alex Smith like Peyton Manning for example? Does he take the first snap of the year for San Francisco? I guess they'll look. They'll look. No, that's their intent, I think, is to have Alex Smith start the season as a quarterback if he's ready. Only if he's ready. Well, Miami with five minutes left on the clock. Now Miami has their trip with a new head coach, with Nick Saban, who has long awaited his time. Such a great college coach. And now we take a look at the green room. Ronnie Brown, is it running back? Is it Braylon Edwards? Is it quarterback is it I mean they, they have a lot obviously you don't pick second without having a lot of need and not a lot of picks certainly a Sertan trade obviously brought him a two you look at not having the early two that went to Philadelphia for AJ Feely but I think you look at the Dolphins running back quarterback you look at wide receiver they have Chambers and Booker not a lot after that so they have a lot of need areas Nick Saban fresh out of the collegiate ranks rest assured he wants to have as many choices in this draft as possible well unlike San Francisco you said Miami has few picks San Francisco has many picks but Miami, this this is one that could shape where they go for a long, long time. Guy that's been a long time observer of the Miami Dolphins in South Florida, our Hank Goldberg. Hello, Hank. Boomer. A lot, a lot of possibilities here. By the way, they have their second pick back in the trade for Patrick Sertan from Kansas City. And they are talking to teams about trading out. But Nick Saban said he wants value. That's a word he uses a lot if he trades out. And the player and their point system must, must match the spot they trade into. If they don't trade out, he will go for need over, or he will go, excuse me, for best player over need. That player has to have the best long-term value for the team, as he says. I asked him, well, what about running back? That's a need. He says they could go three directions as far as that's concerned. One, they've talked with Ricky Williams. They will talk again with Ricky when he comes back from Timbuktu or wherever he is right now. I think it's India. They should, could also go free agent later on or pick a, a running back later on in the draft. You know, I, we also talked about how he's been known in some circles as a guy who likes to run and win with defense. He said, hey, when I had Rohan Davey, we threw all the time at LSU. He likes to throw the football. So when you think about the best player available, think in those terms. Well, we do know that unless the Dolphins make trades, they have this pick and then they'll pick to the third round. So. Nick Saban, who knows these college players, that's for darn sure. And, well, could a phone call already be made? We'll be back. Welcome back to the 2005 NFL Draft, presented by Coors Light. And welcome back to New York. There's Cedric Benson in the green room, Braylon Edwards. Could it be Ronnie Brown? I, I do want to clear up something. Yesterday, the uh, Dolphins uh, uh, sent Patrick Sertan, the, the Pro Bowl corner, to Kansas City. So in that, they did get a second-round pick. So they will be busy, but they're busy right now. Miami, second overall pick. We're going to With see. the uh, second selection in the 2005 NFL Draft, the Miami Dolphins select Ronnie B Brown, running back, Auburn. Well, among other things, Nick Saban knows him darn well, having coached in that league for a long, long time. SEC football, he saw these Auburn running backs up front and center. Really did. You look at a neat area. It was number one on the Dolphins in terms of a running back. They had to prioritize that. Obviously, moving down could have been in the cards. Were they going to get value for that pick? Obviously, Nick Saban didn't feel it was enough to pass on the second opportunity in the draft to take a Ronnie Brown, who he knows very well, coaching at LSU and the SEC, seeing Ronnie Brown, Cadillac Williams, all those other great players in the SEC. You look at Ronnie Brown. The criticism was, well, he never started. It was all about Cadillac. Cadillac was the guy Ronnie Brown was complimentary. You go back to 2002, Cadillac was hurt last six games with the fibula. In step Ronnie Brown. During that season, he put up over 1,000 yards, averaged almost six yards a carry, and scored 13 touchdowns. More. This kid proved that year as a full time back he could get the job done. And as you know, Nick Saban is, is well acquainted with Ronnie Brown of Auburn because they played in the same co Southeast Conference. And I got to tell you, Nick Saban shows he already understands what the draft is about. The word for the last three or four days it's Braylon Edwards, it's Braylon Edwards, it's Braylon Edwards. Why? Because Nick Saban certainly wanted to uh, trade out of that spot if he could get a couple of value picks for him. But where's their greatest need? 
Yeah, yes, they need a quarterback. Yes, they could need a receiver, but it really is at running back where certainly Ricky Williams is, is a huge question mark. Well, not only is it a question mark, it's a pall over the franchise the way it is right now. Not their fault, but a pall over the franchise. You're, you're, you're changing what, okay, they had a big time back who carried 35 times a game, and now they had nobody that could do that. So, Ronnie Brown, now look, he didn't, quote, start. Can he carry the ball 25 times? That's the question, Chris. That's something he's got to answer at the pro level. Can he be the main guy to carry it 25, 30 times a game? But you're watching a kid here. You look at a kid six foot and change, 230 to 235 pounds with 445 speed. Look at the ability here to catch the football down the field, not just on screens and swing passes. Look at a kid here that can block. We're talking about getting Cadillac and Ronnie Brown on the field at the same time. They were able to do that at Auburn this past season. This is a kid who was very productive when he had the opportunity opportunity in a lot of different ways running with the football catching it adequate blocker actually of the Benson Cadillac Ronnie Brown threesome there that triumvirate Ronnie Brown probably was the most questionable blocker that's an area he needs to upgrade a bit but I think the durability concern is there will he be able to hold up he had some minor nicks at Auburn over the long haul when he's the main guy Tori well he will find out we will find out quickly the saving been for me with this guy he will get him the football 20 to 25 times a game. And the question they, is, Mort, I want to ask you this. The chart that everybody goes by, you got to get value on the chart. Can you go off the chart at some point and trade down if you get the opportunity? Well, I think you can if, if you feel like you're still going to get somebody that you really love. And I, I will say this much about Ronnie Brown. You know, you talk about his receiving skills. John Gruden, the head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, told me he thinks Ronnie Brown has the best hands in this draft, receiver or any other position. So that's... That tells you a lot, the of screen, of lot, of, lot of screens, a lot of work for Ronnie Brown here in the next couple of The only thing months. I will say, guys, is when you have three backs bunched together and you have the same grade, trading down's got to be enticing when you know you can get one of those three. Put them on at, pick one, you're going to get a good one. So to take one at two, obviously those deals and those offers weren't enough for Nick Saban to pull the trigger. Well, now the Browns have Braylon Edwards, and, and, and certainly they are listening to any offers. Well, look, look, Ronnie Brown, you said Nick Saban saw him up close and personal. Well, here he is. Here's Auburn against LSU last year. And this is Brown along with Cadillac Williams. And well, Nick had a tough time getting their hands on him. Didn't you go? <laughs> a lot of guys had a tough time with Ronnie Brown. We talk about big with power. And he's not east-west. He doesn't waste time to back. He's north-south. You're one whole runner. He doesn't put a lot of pressure on the offensive line. Give him a crease, and he's going to go. And as a human being, great. Tremendous. You're going to learn about him right now. He's in our green room with our Susie Calvert. Susie? Oh, Ronnie, you spent your entire career at Auburn battling for the number one spot. What motivated you to come back and play a senior season? Oh, uh, it was a lot of things that motivated me. Um, first of all, I wanted to be a first-round guy. I feel like I had the talent to uh, be capable of being a first-round guy. And uh, graduation and uh, just that love for the game and uh, that atmosphere that college creates. And um, just get another experience of that and see, see where I go from there. I was going to go in and offseason. I did everything I could uh, to make sure everything was going to go well for the season as far as workouts and uh, on and off the field. So it definitely paid off for me. And why did you never gripe about carries? I think it's just uh, something my parents instilled in me. I just character. Um, I made the decision to go to Auburn, so uh, all the situations that came along with it, I was going to have to deal with. And um, one of those situations was playing backup, so uh, I was going to have to make the best of the situation. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, let's go to Sal Pal Antonio in San Francisco. Susie, you know the Cleveland Browns are on the clock, and I just want to get you up to date on what I'm hearing behind the scenes here in San Francisco. We heard Mike Nolan say in the interview with me that he would keep Alex Smith, but a source with knowledge of the 49ers intentions told me a little while ago that they would entertain, entertain trade offers from the Cleveland Browns if the Browns wanted to trade for Alex Smith, and then the Niners would go down to three and take Aaron Rodgers. But probably that was only the case if Braylon Edwards was taken number two by the Miami Dolphins, but still... The Niners would talk to Cleveland if Cleveland wanted to trade for Alex Smith. When I talked to Phil Savage, the GM of the Cleveland Browns, he told me that Braylon Edwards was the number one guy on his board, that he was an NFL player right now, and then unless a team blew him away with a trade offer, he would take Braylon Edwards at three. Boomer? Well, so if that's the case, Sal, everything would remain uh, status quo. Just to clean up, we, we told you this would be the first time since 01 that a running back went in the top five. We haven't, it hasn't been in the top two for 10 years. And Jana Carter went number one overall, the off injured Dick and Jana Carter in 95. And somebody, Tory might remember in 1994 with the second overall pick, Indianapolis took Marshall, Marshall, Marshall. Very familiar with that guy. A terrific back. 
a very a very good back and, and I talk to Marshall all the time and he and he tells me about the durability of backs being able to you know pro prolong your career by taking you know taking less hits so um, you know Marshall Falk is definitely a, a good back and, and these young guys Ronnie Brown Shaq DeVinci they can definitely learn from a, a guy like Marshall Falk. But you know why I brought those two up and just a reminder to everyone at home this is never an act, exact science and look Every one of these guys are great college players. Every one of these guys charts, like they, they should be great in the pros. But look, the two names I mentioned, Marshall Falk, maybe a Hall of Fame career. Kajana Carter, we hardly knew ye. You know, so, I mean, it just shows you that even up at that level, same thing with the quarterbacks. You know, Peyton Manning one, Ryan Leaf two. Yeah. Uh, so now here come the Cleveland Browns, the third team on the clock with a new coach. Romeo Cornell for long in the, I would say the shadows, but a defensive aid to force to Bill Belichick. A big reason why the New England Patriots on defense have excelled and have won three of the last four Super Bowls. And of course, with Bill and Bill throughout the years with New England, that's Giants. Romeo Cornell, his defensive, his defensive credentials, extraordinary. This is a big day for the Cleveland Browns because you start a new era with Romeo Cornell as the head coach, with Phil Savage as the general manager, and this is a franchise since they gone up and running as an expansion franchise that has gotten virtually nothing out of their number one picks. Of course, Kellen Winslow injured last year, but they have to have a big day today, and this has to be the right pick for them. Well, before we we try to understand Romeo Cornell, who is a soft-spoken man anyway. And in that assistant system, you don't hear much from him. But a couple guys who might know something about him are guys with some Super Bowl rings. That will be Mike Brable, Rodney Harrison. They're with our Andrea Kramer as part of our roundtable. Good afternoon, Andrea. Good afternoon, Chris. Yes, we have a great roundtable this year. Once again, John Jansen from the Washington Redskins, Trent Green from the Kansas City Chiefs, and five Super Bowl rings between them, Rodney Harrison and Mike Vrabel. Your defensive coordinator, your entire tenure in New England was Romeo Cornell. Who is this guy? What, what can you tell, him, tell us that will give us some insight into who he is as a person? Well, I think, first of all, you look at a guy with a lot of integrity. And, and he's a coach that, that can approach guys differently. He's got to coach me differently than he coaches Rodney. And I think he does a great job at that. What, it, what comes to mind for you when you, when you think of, of Rack, as you call him? Well, everyone thinks he's a quiet, laid-back coach, but which is evidence when we played, um, not evidence, when we played against the New York Jets, he got in Willie McGinnis's face, and he really challenged Willie McGinnis, and afterwards, they hugged after the game, and it just shows that he's a very intense, fiery coach. He gets, he gets kind of swept under the rug because he's, he's been an assistant for so many years, but Cleveland, they got themselves a great coach. The great thing about the draft is it's always about projection, so... Let's project Romeo Cornell as a head coach. How will he be handling an entire team, do you think? Well, it's going to be different. I mean, it's going to be a lot different for him to come in and say, present to a whole team, this is our package for this week. But uh, he, he's done that with us, and he, he's, he's listened to the players. He, he's done a good job saying, hey, I'll take your input, and I'll think about it, and we can use it or we won't use it. But, I mean, he's going to take that input. And I think he's a player's coach. I think he communicates well with his players. The players respect him. I think it's definitely more responsibility dealing with the offense, defense, as well as the special teams. But Romeo, he's, you, you describe him with one word, preparation. And he's always prepared. He's, he's always ready for the next um, object that, that comes along. And he's definitely going to be a great coach. He's already started to clean house, started to put his imprint on the Cleveland Browns. What kind of players are best suited to play for Romeo Cornell? Well, I mean, I think you have to be tough, physical. Um, you got to be a competitor. You got to go out there. Smart. Yeah. You got to be <laughs> smart. I mean, he's going to throw a lot at you. You know, it's going to be something different every week. You're not just going to line up and do the same things week in and week out. He's going to present different things to the, to the, the other team's offense. Definitely. He, he's, he's one of those guys that when I came in, he sat down and went over the playbook with me and, and I said, oh my God, how, how will I be able to learn all this stuff? And he just said, you know, be patient, make sure you study. All right. Bob. He still don't know it all. Uh, there you <laughs> there go. Know. Well, we do know it all in New York. Let's head back there right now. In games. All right, Andrea and Patriots, I, I, I thought one of the most poignant moments of last year's Super Bowl was when Bill Belichick, Romeo Cornell, and Charlie Weiss had kind of a hug, hug on the sidelines in the final minute uh, of that game against Philadelphia, kind of for a moment thinking about what they've all accomplished together and kind of they're all different ways. Charlie with Notre Dame, Romeo with the Cleveland Browns, and you know, he has certainly waited for his chance. And of course, Belichick for 
marching on with New England. So we heard the type of players that Mike Vrabel and Rodney Harrison said that Romeo would be looking at. Who are they, Mel? Well, you look at what the Cleveland Browns need, Boom. They need, obviously, a wide receiver. You look at a quarterback. Trent Dilfer is the bridge to the young quarterback. Will they address that at some point? Obviously, wide receiver, skill position, talent, and really talent overall. This is a team was the only National Football League club this past season without one legitimate star player. Everybody else had one or more. Cleveland had none. That's why Phil Savage is outstanding at evaluating personnel, one of the best in the business, and Romeo Cornell are now running the Browns organization. They need more ability. They need more talent, and they're going to get it now in Cleveland, and they need it. Kellen Winslow coming off that injury. He's got to be one of the main guys. They want a focal point to be one, at wide receiver to help out Winslow. They want to address that young quarterback. Trent will be the guy for now, but that's only for a year or so. Well, Mel, of all the teams at the top three that I think would cheat the chart, so to speak, in other words, take a little less value than what that chart shows you should get for it, I've always thought it would be the Cleveland Browns because Phil Savage is the general manager there. He needs a lot of players. He needs to rebuild a defense. Yes, he needs a receiver. They had no receiver. They caught at least 60 balls last season. But I really believe that if there's going to be a trade, I thought this would be a spot because they need a lot of players on both sides of the football. You know what? The, the Cleveland Browns have used many a high number one pick since they became reincarnated, if you will, in the National Football League. And I think Gerard Warren and, and of course, Courtney Brown and a number one pick of somebody else, Dallas, Ebenezer Ekopa, all these guys are now on Denver. I think every star player the Browns have had since, except Jim, Kelly, uh, Jim Brown and Leroy Kelly, are now on to the Denver Broncos. Since they've come back in the league, Butch Davis following Chris Palmer, they made the playoffs once, but they're a team going backwards, and so hopefully for them, starting back up. And Trent Dilfer right now is going to start their year at quarterback. So, do they look at a quarterback? Do they look at Aaron Rodgers? Are they a, are they a candidate to pick a quarterback early in the second round? I think they are going to select a quarterback sometime set today or on Sunday. So I don't think it's going to be Aaron Rodgers here. I don't think they're going to trade for Alex Smith, but I do expect them to take a quarterback. But they are quite comfortable with Trent Dilfer. Remember, Savage was in Baltimore when Dilfer won a Super Bowl there. They're going to go ahead and let him be the guy who passes the torch when they do get that quarterback on board. We're talking about personnel. It's not just on offense where they were woefully lacking in Cleveland. How about defense? Now a 3-4 scheme. Well, where's the personnel to run it? They added Gary Baxter and Brian Russell. The secondary has been assisted through that process of picking up players that have been in the league and are proven. The front seven on defense is a major problem area that they have to address on the first day of the draft as well. That's right. We should be ready for surprises, too. Well, we got about 30 seconds left for the brand The pick is coming in now. They use just about their entire 15 minutes. And why not? And well, there's still maybe, I don't think it's a tough name to pronounce at the very top. Sometimes the card gets hung up on a, on a pronouncer. If um, if Blake Brockermeyer or Carl Yastrzemski or somebody <laughs> gets, gets drafted like oh, that. That's exactly right. But the, the, you know, it's exciting. Just think of these coaches. You think of the day for the players. You know, they've waited all their life. Think of these three coaches. With the uh, get to third make their selection first in the 2005 NFL Draft, the Cleveland Browns select Braylon Edwards, oh. wide receiver in Michigan. So I hate to say it's gone the way we wrote it down so far, huh? Not well, hate to say it. Three three. Well, when there aren't clearly defined top guys in a draft, you usually have some situation develop where they're not offering enough because there's not those elite players. So who's going to trade up to get them? We always said, you have a seller, you need a buyer. And in order to make a deal, it takes two teams to get it done. And teams are reluctant to go if more off the chart. I, I would go off the chart. Teams in the NFL are reluctant to do so. Well, let's, let's also remember, again, Savage came from the Baltimore Ravens organization. You always stay true to your board with the Ravens, and obviously Braylon Edwards was his top-rated player. He stayed true to that, even though if somebody had offered enough to make a trade, I think they would have taken it. But listen, as I said, no receiver with 60 catches last year. <laughs> this is certainly a need and a great player. You looked at Braylon quite a bit, Tori. What, what do you think his chances are of coming in and making an impact this year? I think I think this is a, a, a huge pick for, for Cleveland. He will get balls right now. They have no they have nobody to get the ball to. So he will get balls right now. I think he'll come in and make a tremendous impact for the Cleveland Browns right away. He's a big, strong kid. He can run. He, he does a great job of going up for the ball. He can go across the middle. He's big enough to do that. So I think this is a great pick for the Cleveland Browns, and I think he will make an impact right away. And playing in the Big Ten in Michigan, I mean, he understands what the weather's going to be like in Cleveland and in that division. No question about it. You look at Braylon Edwards, and it may sound like I've been bashing Brad. That's not the case. I had to separate Mike Williams and Braylon Edwards. It was a hard call. I went with Mike Williams. He's still on the board. Braylon isn't. Hard. He's a Cleveland Brown. He's got Kellen Winslow tight end. Hard. Now you add Braylon Edwards to that mix. You look at a kid, 6'3", 2'10". 
10. Big, competitive, works hard. He's a great kid. I had a chance to talk to he and his father, Stanley Edwards, here in New York. Loves to play the game, works at it hard. When you talk about some of those drops, it's like a home run hitter. You're going to get strikeouts, but you'll get home runs. You'll get a lot of touchdowns with Braylon. When do those drops occur? Are they drive killers? Do they drop one in the red zone? Where do they occur? Are they inconsequential drops? Any drop can be inconsequential, but he did have a problem in that area. Ohio State came, huge effort with 10-plus catches, but the key drop when they were getting momentum, Michigan was to get back in the football game around midfield, the drop, then the punt. They never seized the opportunity to get back in that football game. And like if Braylon can increase the concentration level, it's not about hand-eye coordination. He's phenomenal in that area. It's not about natural pass receiving skills. He is unmatched in that area. It's about concentration, and he knows that. I'll tell you, he's not defensive for you about criticism. He handles criticism well. You bring it up with him. He has a challenge to say, no, you're wrong. He says, I know. i got to work on that. It's about concentration. You can a receiver, Tori, who drops some catchable balls because of concentration problems in college improve that at the pro level? I, 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 I think so. I, I think they, the quarterback, the, the, the receiver coach, would have to continue to make that a point for Braylon Edwards to work on his consistency of catching the football. And he's a great kid. He likes to learn. He wants to be good. You, you talk to him, he wants to be the best receiver in the National Football League. He wants to be a pro bowler right now. So he's going to make the necessary changes and steps to be, uh, to be that, and he will, he will uh, be a better ball catcher. Well, I think in terms of everybody says, okay, what about the selection? I, myself, would take Mike Williams. But I'll say that about every pick from now on because he's number one on my board. So I'm not going to keep bringing up Mike Williams. You know how I feel about him. Bill Savage, who I trust and I defer to Phil, great evaluator. He said Braylon was the best player in this draft. Braylon Edwards, obviously, to this football team with Kellen Winslow, and then you bring in a 6'3", 210-pound Braylon Edwards, and you got Trent Dilfer as the bridge. Is it Luke McCown, Josh Harris, two young quarterbacks in Cleveland, or do they add a quarterback in this draft? Somebody's going to be the heir apparent to Trent Dilfer. As I said, he's just going to get you to that young quarterback. But this year, to get better, they needed talent. They're going to address the front 7 one defense down the road, starting in round two, more than likely. Uh, again, we're looking at a wonderful picture you just saw. These, these big families are out here. 25. <laughs> this these young men have worked so long for this, and what a proud day for mom, dad, brother, sis. We'll be back. Welcome back to the 2005 NFL Draft, presented by Coors Light. Welcome back to New York City. Braylon Edwards, the number one receiver taken in the 2005 NFL Draft by the Cleveland Browns. What does number one represent to you? And it means a lot. You know, it's really been a theme of my last two years. And, you know, to be the first receiver taken means a lot. And definitely to go to a city like Cleveland, organization like the Browns with a new star with Romeo Cornell, and I'm excited. At Michigan, the goal was to wear that number one jersey. Why? because of what it represents, you know, in terms of Anthony Carter, the things that he did when he was with Michigan, he really represented a great football player, great team guy, and a guy that can get it done at all times. And so I said, if I want to be great, you know, I really would like to wear that number and kind of achieve some of the same things he did. Compare yourself when you first got to Michigan to the player you are now. I think when you first get to college, you know, you're young, you, uh, you don't really know what the game is about, you're not mentally ready to handle what a whole season entails, but as you learn, as you listen, as you humble yourself, you just you really get a feel for what it's about and by the time you're a fourth year fifth year senior you're really ready to step up to the plate and be everything your team needs so what number will you wear in the pros uh, <laughs> I haven't thought about it yet you know I'm just happy to be in the pros I'm definitely happy to be with the Browns and that's all I can think about now congratulations thank you so much Chris. <laughs> that's all right so Braylon Edwards the uh, first pick of the Cleveland Browns and the first pick by the new head coach of the Cleveland Browns and that would be Romeo Cornell who is joining us now on our Coors Light video conference uh, from Cleveland and, and and Romeo so so wait a minute let me get this straight defensive coach wide receiver so you're a head coach now huh? what do you see in Braylon that made him special to you uh, Chris one of the things that we saw in him was that he's a big physical receiver uh, a really competitive attitude uh, I think that you'll see as he blocks he is also an aggressive blocker and he will go get the ball down the field uh, you know, he's been able to make some big plays going up, taking the ball away from defensive backs. And when the game is on the line and in big games, he produces in big games. So we are all excited about that, and we feel good about having Braylon on our team. What's the most important thing for you, Romeo, as head coach now of the Cleveland Browns to, to, to establish in Cleveland, whether it's through the draft this weekend or in training camp? What's the most important thing for you to get across? 
But that we are trying to improve the team. We're going to put as many good players on the team as we can, players with uh, a good attitude, good work ethic, uh, and good production. So that's the main thing we want to get out of this draft. How well, you know, you didn't have a lot of time and the season went into February with the Patriots. So how much are you still learning what you have here in Cleveland uh, as opposed to, okay, what I need to do in the future? Is it still a learning process of all the personnel that was there? Uh, sure it is. You know, uh, we haven't been able to put these players on the field yet. So we're going to have to put them on the field and in our system to see exactly how they fit with our system, particularly on the defensive side of the ball more so than the offensive side. But uh, the guys have been in the offseason program. They've been working very hard there. The attitude is great, and we're excited about getting it turned around here. Well, just like these guys have a, have a chance, you waited a long time for your chance as head coach. Do you pinch yourself sometimes, say, my goodness, the day finally came? No, not yet. You know, we haven't played a game yet. It's well, been you exciting lost to yet. this You're point. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, hey, hey, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> no, Nobody uh, second yeah. guessed is a thing. <laughs> well, that's that's perfect. It just never stays that way, though. All right, Romeo Cordell. Good luck onward and upward with the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. All right, so Romeo, his first pick, Braylon Edwards, a great football guy, finally getting a chance to run his own team. Now with Chicago on the clock, running back Cedric Benson, it would add up. And welcome back to ESPN's coverage of the draft. The NFL Live set here, Trey Wingo, Merrill Hodge, Ron Jaworski, and Randy Mueller. Guys, with Chicago on the clock, we're looking at a situation where four of the next five teams could be going running back. Randy, pretty good job you've had drafting running backs I'm on green deuce McAllister what's your philosophy when you're looking at a running back in the draft well I think it's a little bit instinctive to be honest with you Trey I think you got to find a guy that gives you the feeling that an off tackle six yard play can be a 30 yard run at each time I'm on green gave me that feeling deuce McAllister gave me that feeling I think if a guy gives you the feeling he's going to get a bigger gain than it's designed that's a pretty good way to go with all the backs that are still left on you got Carnell, you got Cedric Benson. Which one that you guys like you think could be the, a quarterback's best friend? Is it Benson because he's the guy that's gotten 100 yards a game, 25 carries a game? Well, studying them both, and you, you got to take these guys from college to the National Football League. The thing that you've got to be is a horse, and you've got to be able to run everywhere. You've got to be on tackle to tackle. You've got to get to the perimeter. And can you expand your offensive coordinator's game plan? That means can he use you in the passing game? I don't know if they can use Cedric Bench as much in the passing game as Ronnie Brown is going to be used in Miami, but he's a horse. You can count on him for 20, 25 carries. When you look at Cadillac Williams, I think he's limited where he'll be able to run in the National Football League. Now, in college, he went tackle to tackle on the outside, but in the National Football League, he'll be more of a perimeter runner. That's why I think Chicago will go with Cedric Benson from Texas over Cadillac Williams from Auburn in this well, well, when you look at Chicago right now, a quarterback's best friend is a running back, and certainly Rex Grossman would love to have that running back right now. He acquired Moosin Muhammad in the offseason. That'll give him that explosive, deep threat down the field. And for the Bears, it's all about dimensions. How many dimensions do you have on offense that the defense must stop? Cedric Benson would be the kind of guy that they'd love to have. But over 1,100 carries in college. Can he keep up that durability in the pros? Chicago is on the clock. Let's go back to Chris Berman in New York. Boom! All right, Trey and guys, thank you very much. The Not Bears are about to make their pick, the year two of the, the Lovey Smith era. And uh, well, we'll wait to see if it is Benson. But look, in that weather, in that, I mean, I know they have Thomas Jones, but it, they have to run the ball. All, you know, they have to move the ball. Points, worst. Total yards a game on offense last year, the worst. Passing, the worst, because Grossman got hurt and they went through everybody this side of Billy Wade. The sacks, the worst. Offense, they, they, they you know, they, their defense is okay with Lovey. They made some very good draft picks last year, yeah. but they need to move the chains. And will Rex Grossman be a good quarterback? But that's a discussion for about 30 seconds. The Bears are theoretically off the clock, but the card is in. The Chicago Bears. <laughs> With the uh, fourth selection in the 2005 NFL Draft, the Chicago Bears select Cedric Benson, running back, Texas. Now, I just... This has been out there, and, and why not? Look, can I just, before you show the highlights, Mel, let the folks at home listen to this. Four years at Texas. Last year, 326 carries. The year before, 258. 
The year before, 305 as a sophomore. The year before, 223. 1,100-plus carries for 1,800, 1,300, 1,300, 1,000. 5,500 yards. I, we met him last night. We talked to him a little bit, and I said, man, 1,100 carries, 5,000 yards? He goes, we're just getting started. <laughs> Chris, go back to high school. You know how many yards you rushed for in high school? 8,000. 423 yards and 127 touchdowns. Obviously an emotional day. Happy day for Cedric Benson. Look at him. I mean, as many times as he's carried the ball and has forced that sort of pain and emotion on guys trying to tackle him. This is clearly a young man that, give me the ball, let me show you what I can do. And he's, he's overwhelmed by it. I mean, the bottom line with the running back. He's, he has every right to be. I mean, and, and, and if I'm, if I'm Lovey Smith and I see this young man crying, I know I got a passionate football player. I'm going to put the ball in his hands, and I'm going to tell him to carry the load for me. I like to see the tears. I like to see the passion. That's what it's all about, being in New York and, I, and actually hearing his name. And, and even though he, we've been saying Bears and Benson, I, he's had to listen to a lot of critics in the last two weeks say he's the third back. He's sliding in this draft. Well, he didn't slide in this draft. He's the fourth pick in it. Yeah, second running back overall, Morton. You look at Cedric Benson. I talk about the career in high school. You talk about tread on tires. He's taking a lot of hits. I'll tell you what, he's been out there performing and touching. And keep in mind, athletic ability. He was drafted in the 12th round coming out of high school by the L.A. Dodgers. Opted to play football, obviously, at Texas. So a multi-skilled athlete. Touchdowns in the red zone. This kid, the initial defender, never bring him down. Great leg strength. You see it here. The power, 5'10 and a half, 222 pounds. And he's even stronger. And he pays like he's 240. You watch this kid, you would think he's about 240, 245. I look at touchdowns as a freshman, 13. Sophomore, 12. Junior, ni uh, 19. 21. That's over 40. You talk about 40, 50 touchdowns. This kid makes it happen in the red zone. I had one NFL GM that I respect tell me he's the best red zone runner he ever scouted. That says a lot for a running back. Red zone ability, Torrey Holt, how important is it? The red zone ability to run the football is very, very big, and he will have a lot of opportunities to do that in Chicago. I had another very well-respected general manager that tell me he was the safest pick in this draft because all those carries Never been hurt, Mort. That's right, and I think everybody feels that this guy, you knew what you were getting when you took him. And, and Ron Turner is the new offensive coordinator of the Chicago Bears, and he will pound the ball with this guy and give Rex Wilson some breathing room. Why wouldn't you? And the debate here, guys, was wide receiver or running back. You got signed Moussin Mohamed. Spent a lot of money bringing Mohamed in. Who's opposite Mohamed? Is it going to be Justin Gage? He was a disappointment. Will it be Bobby Wade, Bernard Berry? And I think the Bears will have to address wide receiver in round two. Thomas Jones, serviceable, good. So do you want to improve on that with Benson? You do. You get that upgrade. Keep in mind, Thomas Jones led them with 56 catches. That tells you about wide receiver not being that good, but he'll be the main guy, Benson Will, and Thomas Jones will be there to help him out. And if you're a running back, there's a little history of running backs in Chicago. Yes, it is. And, and I'm sure that's not lost on Cedric Benson, who's with Susie right now. Sus? Well, Chris, clearly so much emotion. How can you express what you're feeling right now? I can't, you know. It's, uh, it's been a tough process for me, you know, and uh, I didn't know how things were going to turn out or, or, or what was going to happen. You know, I had to deal with a lot of, you know, a lot of things that I didn't even, you know, I didn't even expect or think I would have to deal with coming into it. Well, like what? You know, just 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 the Ricky stuff and background stuff, and you know, it was like it was like a such a, I don't know, it just feels so good for it to finally be over. You know, it just feels good for. It just feels good, you know. When you say Ricky, Ricky Williams. Why were people so quick to compare the two of you? Man, uh, you know, same school, same hair. Both great athletes, both African-American. You know, just, it was easy. It was easy for them to do that instead of figuring out the real me, you know, or, or looking deeper within. It was easy to just say, oh, it's just, you know, it, or whatever. You know? Well, for people unfamiliar yeah. with the look, you had dreadlocks. Why did you cut them off? I, I wanted to get a fresh start. I, I wanted to, you know, just just something new. You know, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't. Uh, it, it was becoming more business like, you know. And um, you know, I was, it's like a job interview. You know, I wanted to be clean cut, look good for them, and uh, just come off best I could to put myself in the best position to be where I am. You know? Who is the real you? <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> 
What did coaches and scouts ask you about? Oh man, just it wasn't really what it wasn't really they were asking me things. They were just you know uh, degrading me, uh, trying to manipulate me. Uh, you know, talking down. Uh, you know, I rescheduled an interview one time. And one guy told me, am I going to miss practice? Because, you know, it is, I thought it was a, uh, I thought the uh, process was a, uh, a big slap in the face, you know, for everything I've done and the way I've carried myself and tried to present myself. You know, there's no respect for what you've done, but obviously the Bears believe in me and uh, we're going to get some things done in Chicago. How do you feel about the respect now? I feel a whole lot better. and. Um, I'm eager and, and, and anxious and ready to uh, ready to go to Chicago and get things done. Congratulations. Thanks. Have a great ride. Appreciate it. Chris? Suze, Cedric, he has a chance now to turn that back on opposing tacklers. 1,100 carries, 5,500 yards. Hello. Give me the ball and give it to me again. <laughs> and that's perfect for Chicago. <laughs> I, 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 think it's, I, think the fit, I think it's a perfect fit. They, now, Tampa on the clock next. This is Aaron Rodgers' time. He's in the green room. We know, as Aaron went, it's going to happen quickly. He didn't get worse this week, okay? And by the way, there'll be very quickly a Cadillac pulling out of the garage. Yeah. It's not so much, oh, the third. But, well, when three backs go in the first six, seven, or eight picks, they all have chances to be phenomenal. Cadillac Williams soon as well. We'll be back. Speed. Elusive. There goes Cadillac. Go crazy, Cadillac. Hands. Go crazy. I think a team will have no risk in drafting me. They can only game. And there's Carnell Cadillac Williams. The running back from Auburn. Watching home Jackson. It'll hit, will it be his turn? Or will it be another Williams? Mike Williams, who had dinner with, with Bucks folks last night. Bruce Allen's a general manager, yeah. yeah. But I'm always leery when somebody lets you know on the organization that he's having dinner with us tonight. They, when they start leaking stuff the night before the draft, you just wonder why. Well, we got to find out if they went to Burns Steakhouse or wherever <laughs> they went. <laughs> That's exactly get, out, right. get Bruce on the horn, will you? Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, Cedric Benson uh, is the Bears, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Two years removed from the Super Bowl, and where are they going? The Bucs are picking fifth now overall. we got about four minutes left on the clock uh, for the Bucs. Could this be Aaron Rodgers right here? Could I mean, look, they have they have Brian Greasy. They have Chris Sims at quarterback. Brian has won early with Denver. Chris Sims young. If their fathers are playing, it's a no-brainer. They're all set at quarterback. But is it a no-brainer? Boomer, here's the thing Aaron. about this draft. This is a big draft for John Gruden because they are in transition going from older to younger. They do have some quarterbacks on the roster. John Gruden worked out Aaron Rodgers. He really liked Aaron Rodgers. But as their team stands now, I think it's going to be a tough pick for them to go ahead and do this. So, yes, Mike Williams is a possibility here. Certainly Cadillac Williams is a possibility here. But a trade is also a possibility here as well. There are some teams that have been talking to the Bucs about moving up with the Bucs sliding back a little bit. And you talk about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers quarterback situation. I thought Brian Greasy had a solid year overall. I think he wasn't the problem. I think you look at Chris Sims, developmental young quarterback, should be coming into an area of his career where he presents a challenge. And I think you look at wide receiver, Michael Clayton, great rookie year. You can make the argument if he was in this draft to be the number one pick. You look at the running back situation, needing help there. So I think those two spots, running back, wide receiver, a priority for John Gruden in this draft. So uh, let's very quickly, as the Bucks have three minutes to go uh, with their pick, go out to San Francisco. Sal Palantonio has some news on where the Bucks might be looking. Sal? Well, boom, everybody expected that Alex Smith would be a guy that John Gruden would be interested in, but I just got off the phone with the Niners draft room, and they said they have not gotten a call from Tampa Bay. Uh, it is true that what Chris Mortensen said that John Gruden likes Aaron Rodgers, but it's also very true that Gruden and the Bucks organization are under a lot of pressure to fill a need because they have Brian Greasy there and they have to get a running back and a wide receiver. So I think that's the direction they will go, but they have not been talking to the Niners about trading for Alex Smith, Boomer. All right, Sal, thank you very much. So two Williamses and a Rodgers. Is it, uh, what do we think? What should they do? 
you know, Mel should tell you. Don't ask me because I'm going to bring oh, up he said Mike Williams. Except he, if I say Williams, I'm probably in good shape because I like Cadillac and I like Mike. So I'm not going to say I, Mike Williams again except the Williams guys, they're good football players. I do think this, when you look at Tampa Bay, I'm a Brian okay. Greasy fan in terms of saying he's solid. I don't think you necessarily need to go that route. I know it was discussed about Alex Smith because Alex Smith is so smart. Aaron Rodgers has been in the mix. But I really think when you look at Cadillac Williams, and keep in mind, John Gruden worked with and coached Cadillac Williams all week at the Senior Bowl practices in Mobile. And we have history tells us that coaches down there usually take a player or two that they work with that week. Well, I, 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 think, I, I think I'm going to take a back. You know, I, I think the back takes a lot of will take a lot of pressure off Brian Greasy. You have a great receiver out on the outside with Clayton. So Cadillac Williams right now I think will be a, a great fit. He can get outside. He can run inside a little. He's tough. Has a great passion for the game. So I think he can add some toughness and be a great back down in Tampa Bay. And again, take some pressure off Brian Greasy to allow him to make some throws down the football team to make them better offensively. Bucks last year 29th in rushing. They had Pittman. They you know that they need more than that. Obviously. The Tampa Bay Bucks, who all of a sudden, remember when they were defending Super Bowl champs, it was, well, this division is a walk. And all of a sudden, Carolina jumped up and became very good. Now here's Atlanta, who's at the precipice. Of his, all of a sudden, it's tough to make headway in this division. No, it is. And you've got to run the football in this division. You know, the Buccaneers have 93, 93 yards rushing per game. So I think that John Gruden, as much as he likes to throw the ball, clearly he knows he's got to get a pictured well, running back. Well, clearly... <laughs> Pictures do not lie. And so it's time to take the Cadillac out of the garage. I, I had a feeling it was a cigar maker down in Tampa that kind of gave us a hint at this. I didn't have a chance to quite light that up, but it is, it's Cadillac Williams, a guy who got his nickname, and I got to like this, a sportscaster in Birmingham, Alabama, looking at this young man play high school football. They Mike rate us and look at him. He's running like a Cadillac. And it's stuck. Imagine that. Nicknames from a sportscaster. Here's the <laughs> Got it right. With the fifth selection in the 2005 NFL Draft, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers select Carnell Williams, running back, Auburn. And so how about not only three running backs in the first five, which is unheard of, but two running backs, same team, first five. Two Auburn running backs of the top five. My goodness, I mean, Auburn should have been in the NFC South. Hey, hey, Chris, go back in Auburn's history. Remember Joe Cribbs? Remember James Brooks? Bo Jackson? The list goes on and on. This Andrews. is a, a program exactly that has produced a lot of running backs over the years. Now two in the top five. Cadillac's hero was the late, great Walter Payton. And you see that Walter Payton running stop attacking defenders. And I think he takes great pride in hurting defenders. I tell you what, in the box, between the tackles, he is at his best. Great feet, great vision. And you talk about with that style of 217 pounds, up from about 200. 5-2-10. Can he be durable at the pro level? Well, he was durable at Auburn, and the only injury he had was at Fibula 2002. Since that time, he's been spectacular. He proved even as a freshman he could carry it 41 times against Georgia. Great improvement as a pass receiver out of the back that I thought it was majorly questionable in that area as a junior. Worked on it hard and became better and more reliable as a senior. That's the only question that I have on Cadillac is his durability. A guy being 5'10", 217 pounds, can he continuously take that pound in, in the National Football League? And I know he did when he was in Auburn, but it's different when Variable and Mike, uh, uh, Rodney Harrison is hitting on a consistent basis. Attacking base. defender story, he won't change that style. Right. Will that lead to some injury problems at the program? I, I, I think it can. I think it can if he doesn't change his style. I don't want him to get too far away from it because I want him to be aggressive. I want him to, to be the player that he is, but he has to be able to pick his spots. And I've talked to a lot of great backs. You have to be, you have to pick your spots in order to stay durable in the National Football League. Well, and as we said, the first time ever that we've had three backs go in the top five. And one thing you should know is that if you're looking for a position to make an immediate impact, you would say running back as a rookie across the board except for the durability of playing the 16 games in the preseason that is where you can make your best mark across the board as a first-year player in the national football league and so miami and chicago and tampa bay are counting on just that tennessee is next on the clock and uh, we have uh, aaron Rodgers, still a quarterback waiting to happen 
Uh, he's taking a walk out of the green room a little bit. I don't, I don't blame him. Is this a spot that people might come up to move? Does Tennessee start to think, well, how many years left does Steve McNair have? Who sat for a couple years before he ever took a snap? We'll be back with the Titans. And so, running backs, same school, first round. Well, Vic and Bernstein, Bernstein wasn't really, he was a half running back, so he's not on our list. So you have to go back to 86, like uh, the Florida, and you go to the Southeastern Conference again. One of my favorite players, John L. Williams, drafted by the Seahawks, along with Neil Anderson, who had a nice career with Chicago. And then back in 71, big John Brockington from Ohio State became a Packer. And the little guy, little Leo Hayden, became Minnesota Viking. And now Ronnie Brown, Miami, Cadillac Williams, Tampa Bay. Doesn't happen often. That's quite a full house backfield. Susie Culver talking with a happy Cadillac. You're absolutely right about that, Chris. And we welcome in Carnell Cadillac Williams from Gadsden, Alabama. First off, for everybody who doesn't know, how'd you get the name Cadillac? Oh, the name Cadillac came from by, by a guy named Mike Rader. He do high school football down my way. He said I ran smooth like a Cadillac, and he know it done stuck with me. Okay, well, you ran smooth, but who's the football hero? Uh, my football hero is Walter Payton. Uh, you know, he, he's a great human being. You know, uh, I mean, he did great things in Chicago all the time, was second time, leading Russia. So uh, that's my favorite player. You and Ronnie Brown in constant competition. What was the relationship like? Oh, man, we had a real good relationship. I mean, we best of friends. Both of us very unselfish. Uh, you know, me and Ronnie Brown had a bet going who was going to be taking first. He, he won the bet, but we got a couple more coming down the road. So, uh, you know, Ronnie, I owe you. <laughs> you know, everybody puts on the hat of the team that selected them. So since you're not in New York, how many NFL hats did you have to have in your house? Actually, I had two hats per team. So, uh, th therefore, I, I was hoping the hat came down to Tampa Bay, in which it did. And you know, I want to thank Coach Gruden and his staff for selecting them. You know, I'm looking to do big things down there. Now, you and Ronnie Brown often had some friendly wagers, most catches, most yards. What about who went first in the draft? Um, you know, we had a little something on dinner, then a little side bit between me and him, you know, which, of course, you, you all know that he won. But we got some other things down the road as who had the best year and, you know, a couple more things. So, you know, uh, he, he might have won the war, but the battle is not over. <laughs> Cadillac, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you in Tampa Bay. And speaking of Tampa Bay, through our Coors Light video conferencing, we welcome in the head coach of the Bucks, John Gruden. So, John, what did it take for you to fall in love with Cadillac Williams? It took about one day at the Senior Bowl. Uh, we were fortunate to coach down there in Mobile, and we knew a lot about Cadillac, obviously, from what he got done in college. and. He put an exclamation point on that in Mobile. We love this guy. We're going to build a great por a part of our offense around him. He's unselfish, and he's an electrifying playmaker, and he's something we need here. Three running backs go in the top five, but what is it about him that for you really stood out above the others? Well, I think if you just look at him carefully, he, he can catch the ball. There have been uh, some real bad rumors about maybe that's not his strength, but he returned punts, kickoffs. He can catch the ball out of the backfield, and in the open air, he's as good as I've seen. We're really excited to have him, and obviously the guys that were picked ahead of him were classy, great football players also. Since the Super Bowl, there's been so much change. How does a team deal with that? Well, everybody's changing. Even the teams that were in the Super Bowl last year uh, had change. Uh, hopefully, Cadillac Williams, Michael Clayton will give us two building blocks on offense that we can build around. And we've got a lot of draft picks left today, and we, we're uh, intent on coming back here strong this, this fall. Okay, John, we'll see you often throughout the day. All right, Susie. Chris, let's go back to you. All right, Sus, Coach Gruden, not the usual full-blown Tommy Bahama shirt for Coach Gruden, <laughs> but I'm sure we'll get to that a little bit later on. One thing we do want you folks out there to understand, Cadillac Williams and Ronnie Brown, and you heard Susie talk about it, you heard Cadillac talk about it and Ronnie beforehand, the relationship in which two guys share time 
and a big time backfield is usually one of jealousy or let's not say best friends. Mort, Mel, Tor, I mean, for these guys to be, they're, they're more than best friends. I mean, they're it's tight, and they should understand that these are the type of people that they are. Chris, I think it helped their draft standing. It showed that they had a selflessness, a team-first type attitude. I know that Eddie Grand, their running back coach, felt that they had the, that, type of, that type of character, as well as Tommy Tuberville, their head coach. Yes, it helped them in this draft. I think it's a, I think it's a, a great testament to, to their character and, and what they brought to the University of Auburn. That's why they, both of these guys have been selected so early. So it's a great testament to their character. They let that carry over into the National Football League and in, in, in Tampa Bay. And this bunch has 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 great uh, draft picks with these two guys. Well, now we see Tampa Bay trying to recapture what they had a couple of years ago. They still got a very good defense, but a couple of years removed from a Super Bowl. Tennessee has been a perennial playoff team until last year. When the bottom fell out, injuries were the primary reason. But all of a sudden, playoff perennial team fell to 5-11. and 11. Now, it's interesting. They haven't drafted this high since they were the Houston Oilers, and they used that pick for Steve McNair. McNair will be back. The Titans are on the clock with three and a half minutes. But, for example, one of the many players that Tennessee lost was Samari Roll. Do they then pick another roll at corner? I think they would go Pac-Man or Roll or Rogers. All three of those guys. My top guy was Pac-Man, and John Gruden touched on it with Cadillac Williams. The kick, punt return skills. Also with Adam Pac-Man Jones, who presents that special teams dynamic that gives him versatility to contribute heavily in that area his rookie year. 5'9 and a half, 186. Hey, he's as tough as they come. He'll support the run. He'll throw that body around. Entrell Roll ran that 4-4-9. Not great speed like Pac-Man, but good enough to say he's a true corner. And Carlos Rogers. Just small, but you could argue he was the most consistent, the most steady and reliable cornerback in the country. Just like those three running backs, they all were bunched together. Those three cornerbacks throughout this process has been bunched right in that area where picking one out of the three and separating those guys has been very difficult. And probably, like we saw three of the first five picks are back, maybe three of the next five picks are these corners, three of the next five or six picks. At Tennessee, the pick is in as they start what they hope is just a short dip down and under Jeff Fisher, a quick return. With the uh, sixth selection in the 2005 NFL Draft, the Tennessee Titans select Adam Jones, cornerback, West Virginia. Well, Ooh. the Pac-Man. Adam Pac-Man Jones in Atlanta and starred at West Virginia. He uh, got the nickname Pac-Man as a baby, we understand, right? With the way that he just gobbled down the milk out of the <laughs> bottles and whatever else was put in front of him. I can't believe Pac-Man's been around that long like that game, huh? <laughs> so that's about 20 years ago that already Pac-Man was a hit. And that's how he gets the nickname. And now will he gobble up receivers, although of the three guys, he's the shortest. And he was a hit, and he'll hit, Chris. He'll do it, but I'll tell you what, he'll throw that body around. As I said, he's 5'9 and a half, 186, very compact, strong, and very fast. You see him here playing off. You see ball skills with Pac-Man, that's the key. You know, you got a guys have you in coverage, and they'll be on you. Torrey Holt knows this, but the guy, the receiver still catches the football. What Pac-Man does, great ball skills, and then you see the ability after the interception to return that football. A turnover results in a touchdown sometimes on the other side with Pac-Man Jones. So a guy that has a defensive mentality, and he gets the interception, and an offensive mentality. Kick, punt, return ability is a plus. You see him there on the blitz. You see an aggressive, an intense run support guy. And in an era where you have rules that allow wide receivers to get the best of those cornerbacks, Quarterbacks can't be physical in coverage. You need to recover. You're going to get beaten. You've got to recover. He has 4-3 to 4-3-5 speed. And Torrey Holt, you're the big-time receiver. you got a guy like this that can make up ground. How tough is Pac-Man going to be in the National Football League? I, I think he's going to be a very good player in the National Football League. And the reason why I say that is because he's a tough football player. He, 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 he will get beat at times off the line of scrimmage by bigger receivers. But the young man can recover. And what makes him that much more dangerous, and Tennessee needs a spot, he can return to football. And, and, and this is a guy, yes, he's five, nine and a half, but I know him talking with Jeff Fisher last night, in fact, about the different players. When he started talking about Pac-Man Jones, boy, I got a sense. He loves this guy because he said, hey, look, he's going to get better in this league once he figures out the talent level that he's competing against, yeah. and he is a leaper. In fact, he once got a technical foul when he played basketball for Westlake High School in the Atlanta area, dunking the basketball and hanging on the rim at five, nine and a half. He can jump and get up there, too. What, what, what I like is he's small, and Pac-Man, you're small, 
but you're tough. You got Allen Iverson heart. Keep that heart. Keep that intensity. You'll be a great football player in the national. And on the schedule, I really like that. And on the schedule, playing cornerback for the Tennessee Titans twice a year, the Indianapolis Colts. Yes. So he's going to have to go face to face with the most feared passing attack of the National Football League. Sorry, Troy, they used to be Rams. But of course, Peyton Manning and all the records. When we hey, look at this party in Minnesota, 4,000 can't wait for the Vikes to pick. Welcome back to the 2005 NFL Draft, presented by Coors Light. The Minnesota Vikings, one of the four teams with a pair of first round picks, and this is the pick in Oakland slot that they got for Randy Moss. And that's something we'll discuss right now. So the Vikings on the clock, and that always makes you nervous when you say the Vikings are on the clock. But this time, they vow to, you know, this is a team that's on the move. Uh, they beat Green Bay in the playoffs, and now they lose Moss. Is it then obvious that they should pick a wide receiver here? Mel, here's your board. This is a good board still. I think you look at Troy Williamson with speed. That's the thing that he brings to the table is tremendous ability to be a vertical stretch wide receiver. Obviously, you know how much I like Mike Williams. Mark Clayton happens to be our own Torrey Holt's favorite wide receiver in this draft. And I got a list of reasons why he's my favorite receiver in this draft. I like Mark Clayton. I think the young man can play. He's tough. He's small. He's not, he's not a big, he's not a big guy. He's not 6'2, six, 6'2, six, but he's tough. He's smooth. He's elusive. He can run great routes. He can block. Mark Clayton can do a lot of things to help the football team right now. Yeah, I gotta tell you something about the Vikings real quick. They I think had as good an offseason as Absolutely. anybody, and that's amazing when you lose a Randy Moss and you actually may have had a better offseason. And I know their attitude going into today was we can take any player. We don't have to take a receiver. If a receiver is the highest grade, if it's Mike Williams or Troy Williamson, uh, Mike Williams of Southern Cal, Troy Williamson of South Carolina, then they'll take him. But they did not feel compelled to replace Randy Moss with this first pick. And they have drafted well. You got to give them credit. The Vikings, Brian McKinney, Kevin Williams. You go back to getting Nate Burleson where they did. Well, they've done a good job drafting over the last few well, years. They have lately. And here, before we show that trade with Moss, just let me allude to what Mort said in case you missed it. The offseason, no particular order. Cornerback Fred Smoot from the Redskins, now a Viking. Safety Darren Sharper from a, the Packers, now will play the Packers twice a year as a Viking. Big defensive tackle, nose tackle. Uh, Pat Williams from Buffalo, now a Viking. Sam Coward, once upon a time a Pro Bowl linebacker, now a Viking. Napoleon Harris came in a trade, but these are the departures now. The, this is what's going out the other way. And, of course, the bit, by the way, Brad Johnson, yes. the backup quarterback, not Gus Farratt. Hovan wasn't the player that he was. So I'm going to echo what you said, although it's hard to replace 15 to 20 touchdown catches a year with Randy Moss. But the Minnesota Vikings have a chance, and now with two number ones. And remember, they didn't win the division, but they beat the Packers, the champ of the division, in the playoffs. So kind of they were, if you look at it that way, the team on the up in that uh, black and blue division, in the Norris division. And so the Minnesota Vikings, I think, are a big-time threat the entire NFC to go to the Super Bowl. Is that They're, fair to well, say? I think they are th certainly a threat. I mean, listen, you can't lose a Randy Moss and say it's not a that. loss, as you mentioned that. But they are, listen, they're building their defense, which is always a criticism in Minnesota. Yeah, so if they t make a defensive pick here, you go, wow, you, we, we do have to pay attention to that defense. But obviously, they can fill their receiver needs here, Mel. And they pick again. Keep in mind, they pick here, seven. They pick yep. again at 18. They have a second-round pick. I'll tell you, a guy I like in the second round, we're going to jump way at is Mike Nugent, place kicker, Ohio State. He figures to go in round two, and they have to come out, I believe, out of this first round with a wide receiver, especially when you have Mike Williams and Troy Williamson still on the board. You're getting The Vikings are always into value. Who drops? Who's there? Who can make sense at that point? They did it all along throughout the draft process, even with Udeze last year. And they have two wide receivers staring them right in the face. Mel, Mike Williams is your number one guy. Now, he if they're looking to replace exactly the type of player that Randy Moss is at wide out, you might go to the next receiver, Williamson. But so what? Why do they have to have exactly what? You're not going to have very many. Torrey knows that exactly like Randy Moss. Should Mike Williams go to the Vikings? Yes, he should. Should he go? This would be a no-brainer right here. This should be a, a guarantee as far as I'm concerned. If the Vikings agree or disagree, we'll see. But I think we look at Troy Williamson in a run-oriented offense. He's going to transition, but it may take a little longer. He does present great speed. Mike Williams, though, this speed thing is very, very overrated. Williams, and it's a negative. He ran a 4.56. He's 6'5", 230. Ran better than Michael Clayton. Braylon Edwards only ran 4.53 on a track. 
He's faster than Jerry Rice was coming out of Mississippi Valley State, who I might argue, including myself, he's one of the greatest players ever to play the game. It's this notion that Mike Williams can't run and he's slow, forget about it. It's just not accurate. I, I, I think they can take a receiver. And it, it doesn't have to be Mike Williams. It doesn't have to be Mark Clayton. I think Troy Williams is the better fit for them. Mm -hmm. If you notice, Minnesota has a vertical game. Dante Pepper likes to throw the ball deep. Troy Williams adds that he can eat a defensive back's cushion up quicker than I've seen of any of the receivers in this draft. Troy Williams, I think right now for Minnesota would be a very good, uh, and, very good. And pick. back to the defensive uh, part of the discussion, the folks at the University of Maryland said that the Vikings were paying a lot of attention to their outside linebacker Sean Merriman this week. So that's another thing. As I say, the Vikings well, want to become a dominant defensive team as well. Right. Look, at 18, you're still going to get a pretty darn good receiver. Yeah. So let's—I yeah. mean, they could pretty much count on that. Uh, so we'll see what the Vikings do. But Merrill Hodge. Uh, joins us now, uh, Haji Sheik, up at our uh, NFL Live studio. And Haji, Mike Williams, I, I, I guess we just dis everyone disagrees, don't they? Well, you know what, Boom, it's about this. When you look at Mike Williams and you study him on tape, he is 6'5". When you look at him transitioning to the National Football League, he still lumbers. When studying him in, on tape in college, he was challenged every time he caught the football. But because he's 6'5", he was able to catch it. When you look at him in the National Football League, he'll have to play on the weak side. A couple things will have to be in place for him to be effective. They'll have to have a dominant wide receiver on the strong side and a dominant running game. When it's third and five, yes, he can give you six yards. When it's third and 15, he is not going to be a threat. And there's no such thing in the National Football League as an uncoverable wide receiver. Mike Williams would be the first. We've already had teams that have passed on something we've never seen before. Mike Williams will be covered in the National Football League and challenged consistently. Well, Merrill, there's one thing about, uh, about Mike Williams. How about in red zone? Red zone, now there's a guy, right, with his size and his, and he plays kind of like a, like a power forward at times, right? Isn't he a great red zone receiver? Well, he is, and I think it gets down to size and speed. If you want the burner, the burner is Troy Williams. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. He runs in the four threes. He's got good size. There is 28-9 a catch as a freshman at a 99-yard touchdown reception and a run-oriented offense, or his numbers would have been off the charts. Now, I look at Williamson as a guy. If you're looking, you say, hey, we have to replace Randy Moss with true speed. You go with Williamson. If you want the best player in this draft, you take Mike Williams. And the Vikings have been on the phone with Williamson during the time they've been trying to make this pick. Mm -hmm. Williamson. Well... And the pick is in. Good dialogue. With the uh, seventh selection in the 2005 NFL draft, the Minnesota Vikings select Troy Williamson, wide receiver, South Carolina. Well, you guys outlined the choices. If you want what Moss, what, and I'm not saying he's going to be as good as Randy Moss, of course not. But the speed that Torrey and Mel and Moore talked about, that this would be. The guy who is a burner, what, 4.31, and something to think about. You say in a run-oriented offense, to Holtz, et cetera. You know, it took Timmy Brown a year, Rocket Ishmael, well, let's just go to Timmy Brown a year or two to kind of grasp the pro thing. He grasped it pretty good for the rest of his career. That's a great point, Boom. I think it's exactly right. Lou Holtz's offense did produce some wide receivers, and Timmy Brown front and center there in that offense. And you look at the scatter arm quarterbacks, not real accurate. That limited the amount of receptions that Williamson could have. But you're not looking at a smurf. You're not looking at a little guy who can run 4-3. Troy Williamson is 6-1 and change, 202 pounds. He was down at the senior boats, hanging out down there, watching. Obviously, couldn't participate as an underclass, but a kid who's got a ton of athletic ability. And obviously, the Vikings want to replace Randy. Randy Moss with speed, and they got big-time vertical stretchability if, in fact, Torrey. The route running, the preciseness of those routes is something Troy has to work on. That'll definitely be something that he has. That'll be something all these receivers will have to work on, and, and, and Troy will. But now they have try, they have a trifecta. They have uh, Troy Williamson now. They got Nate Burleson on the inside. They got Marcus Robinson on the outside. And when you talk red zone, Marcus Robinson, I think, can give them that in the red zone. You want to throw a fade? I think Marcus Robinson is big enough, he's strong enough to go up, attack the football, and help them well, in the red let's zone. Remember when Randy Moss came into this league, he wasn't a route runner. They just sent no, him vertical. And I had one team tell me that Williamson was the number two rated player on their board in this draft. And what would have happened had he played for Steve Spurrier at South Carolina? He might have been the first, I mean, he might have been a top five pick before well, Edwards. With Dante Culpepper, who this side of Peyton Manning's 49 touchdown passes last year, had 39 and, and actually threw for more yards if you really want to look at the stats. Um, you know, it's no question what they can and what they want to do. Williamson is the burner. We'll see. Now, 
John Salisbury once upon a time played some quarterback <laughs> with the Minnesota Vikings. I don't know if it's true that you threw it in the rafters, Sean, but that's where you are right now. I am in the rafters, and I threw more than a couple of the rafters, too, Boomer. And, you know, I, I love the wide receiver pick. Troy pick. Williamson, it's a pick on speed based on raw potential because you lose Moss, you get Williamson, and a guy who is a game-breaker. And what receiver doesn't know how, I mean, doesn't need help on learning how to run routes? I can teach a receiver how to be a crisp route runner. I can't teach speed, and that's what they got. And in response to the Mike Williams, who nobody's picked yet, and Merrill Hodge, I'm not quite sure what's the, what tape Merrill's studying because I've seen Mike Williams make great, tough catches. Merrill had him going in the fourth round. Mike Williams is a steal from here on out. Good pick by the Vikings, but anybody that gets Mike Williams is going to get a pro bowler and a playmaker who catches the ball with his hands. That's why Merrill likes those factor backs. Tell him to stick to those guys. All right, Sean. Well, Sean and Merrill teeing it up. <laughs> under two hours into the draft. So Troy Williamson becomes the first Gamecock wide receiver since a man we got to know through the years in the first round pick Sterling Sharp. Pretty good pro career. He went back in 1988 for the Green Bay Packers. Arizona is on the clock. Second year under Denny Green. We'll be back. Welcome back to the 2005 NFL Draft, presented by Coors Light. Well, the uh, Arizona Cardinals on the clock, and could they tap Aaron Rodgers, who is waiting in the green room? And if they don't, uh, w w then you're in some teams that seemingly have their quarterback plans together. But again, you know, you, you Ben Roethlisberger waited till 11. He ended up getting with a team that was much better than 11, the Pittsburgh Steelers, as it turned out. So, again, wherever Aaron Rodgers goes, maybe he's going to a team that he might have the best season of the, uh, compared to Alex Smith, certainly, with the 49ers. So, Aaron shouldn't get down. He didn't get worse this week. Now, on Arizona, would they look at an Aaron Rodgers? I mean, they have Kurt Warner, who we'll talk about in a moment, but obviously Kurt's not going to play there eight years. Oh, and they have looked at Aaron Rodgers, but I think Denny Green feels like he's made a commitment to Kurt Warner, and he doesn't want Kurt to have to go through what he went through last season in New York, bringing in a first-round quarterback and all the speculation starting if he has a couple rough games about, okay, when's the number one pick coming in? So I don't see a quarterback here. I really believe it'll be somebody, a big corner like Andrew Roll that fits the style of their defense. Well, let me ask, to when we're on Warner, we get another question about a running back. But, Torrey, look, Kurt played. The Giants won the first half of the season, but then it was apparent that behind that offensive line that, that Tom Coughlin made the switch to Eli Manning. Kurt has another chance in Arizona, several years now removed from his Pro Bowl status, his Super Bowl status. You know him better than all of us. How will he do in Arizona? Can he recapture some of what he had? I, I, th I think he can. I think Kurt really can recapture with some of the, some of the things that he's done in the, in the past uh, couple of years leading up to going to Arizona. If, if Arizona does a great job of protecting this young man, or protecting Kurt, he has three good receivers, I think, on the outside with Fitzgerald, Quan Bolden, and, and, and Brian uh, Johnson. So uh, he has the weapons on the outside. I think the key, the key uh, factor for Arizona will be the tight end position with Freddie Jones. If he can get some quick check downs, some easy throws, that again give Kurt that much more confidence. The running game is going, the passing game is going. Now he can do the thing that he liked to do, and that's beat you deep. From what you saw, Torrey, with the thumb both when he finished up at St. Louis and when he, you know, with the Giants last year, can he, I mean, from 99 to 01, you guys won a Super Bowl your rookie year. You played to, to a field goal game to the Patriots in 01. Since then, obviously not the same. Is it the thumb? Is it? Is he not throwing right? Is he? You, you know what? Uh, only Kurt knows about the thumb. You, if, if you talk to Kurt, tell, Kurt will tell you it's nothing wrong with his thumb. But the, the numbers don't lie. So we'll see. You know, he'll, he'll have another chance in Arizona. Right. He can go there and prove that he's worthy of being there and lead that football team to some wins. So, uh, you know, we'll see. But lis listening and talking to Kurt, he says nothing's wrong with his hand. So we'll see. Well, let's see. If they can get even close to what it was, it'll be an uptick, uptick in, uh, in Arizona. Uh, if not, they have Josh Tears of McCown waiting in the wings. Remember, Denny did a lot of quarterback jumbling last year. After a pretty good start for Arizona, it didn't work out that well. But year two for Denny Green, you know they'll improve. 
Well, Mike Tice uh, has the Minnesota Vikings on the up, despite the fact that uh, uh, the most heralded offseason trade sent Randy Moss out. Suze, you got him on the horn? Mike Tice waiting in our wings, and that number seven pick, courtesy of Oakland, where Randy Moss went. Mike, what was it like for you to say goodbye to Randy Moss? Well, certainly, Randy and I are, uh, were very close. Uh, we had a tremendous relationship. We lost a lot, a lot of production when Randy left. We don't think we'll be able to recoup that production, but we have other leaders and other playmakers on our football team that need to step up their game. At the same time, we need to add other playmakers, and we think we added a playmaker in Troy Williamson out of South Carolina, uh, a guy that we fashion uh, as a faster Nate Burleson. He's got a lot to learn, all young receivers do, and we're real excited about having Troy. What's the thought process of changing the identity of this offense? We need to be a tougher football team, period. And I think that's one of the things we need to look at is possibly run the ball a little bit more, but we're not going to run the ball 40 times a game. And, and uh, being more physical up front, we get Jim Kleinsauce back and Mike Rosenthal back. That's like adding two more free agents to your offense. And certainly Jermaine Wiggins had a big season last year. Our quarterback is as good as anybody in the league. And, and we have a nice running back core. So uh, we're, we're real excited where we're at offensively. We need to improve on defense, and we think we made steps in that direction with free agency and the good veteran players and leaders that we added. And another pick coming up in the first round. Mike, thanks. We'll see you in a bit. Thanks, Susie. Chris? All right, Susie, Mike, thank you very much. Arizona, you know, Antrell Roll is also back there in the green room. Maybe, maybe it's his turn. Pick is in. With the uh, eighth selection in the 2005 NFL Draft, the Arizona Cardinals select Antrell Roll, cornerback, University of Miami. Hey, look, there is no question that all three of these corners project right, Mel, uh, Pac-Man Jones, Antrell Roll, Carlos Rogers. I mean, you can't argue with, I know, Mike, but they don't need a receiver. No, they don't. That's they a wide don't receiver need. a lot the last few years. So this pick makes perfect sense. Yeah, I think cornerback, you talk about a glaring need. They don't have anything that resembles a number one corner, and they don't even have really a starting corner on this football team. And guess what? They go with the intro roll now. I bet you Denny Green takes another cornerback or two in this draft fairly early, early to mid rounds. So he ends up with three cornerbacks throughout this process. That position is so weak on paper right now. David Macklin and virtually nothing else. Antrell Rose is going to be asked to come in right away and start for Denny Green. You look at the three corners we talked about. Not much separating. Pac-Man Jones, he just went to the Tennessee Titans. Now Antrell Rose to Arizona at pick number eight. And the Washington Redskins are sitting there at nine. Fred Smoot's the Viking. They need a corner. And there's yes. Carlos Rogers from Auburn. So we said the running backs were going to come off in a, in a bunch. And the cornerbacks are coming off in that grouping as well. And speaking with Dennis Green last night, now the coach of the, of the Arizona Cardinals, he said that Antrell Rowe fit his defense perfectly. They have a lot of speed on the outside. They blitz a lot with defensive yep. coordinator Clancy Pendergast. And the blitzing allows a big cornerback to get his hands on a receiver, yep. hold him up while they can get to the quarterback. And, and, and I want to allude to what, what Amor just said. They do do a lot of blitzing. And this young man is strong enough, he's physical enough, he can also run with you to be able to cover up for those blitzes that they're doing. So I think this is a good and, you'll, and he's a good zone coverage uh, defensive back as well. And you'll get to see him twice a year. You'll get to see him twice a year, and he'll get to see me as well. <laughs> Tori, hey, get to I'll tell you what, as you said, blitzing off the edge. You see it with Rondé Barber a lot in Tampa Bay. You yeah. see it with Antrell Rowe as well. Very effective coming off that edge at that cornerback spot on the blitz. He had 17 and a half tackles for loss in his career, four and a half sacks, big at six foot and a quarter, 200 pounds, and everybody said safety or corner. Yeah. Then he ran that 4-4-9. Four, four, now, it's not a 4-3-9, four, but 4-4-9 four, four, is effective enough. It's fast enough, at least early in his career. He can be a corner. He's got an attitude. When I talked to Antro a few weeks ago. He said, hey, I shut out Larry Fitzgerald. Guess what? He's going to be a teammate of Larry Fitzgerald's now. Did a great job against Reggie Williams, former early first-round pick last year, the Jaguars. This kid's experience in practice. Miami of Florida always has wide receivers with the Hurricanes that he's matching up with in practice. Tough kid, very good in run support. Obviously, Denny Green needed a corner. Three good corners in this draft. Not much separating him, and all of a sudden, Antrell Roll will be a starter guaranteed as a rookie with the Arizona Cardinals. Yeah, now, the only concern I heard from teams that were looking at the cornerback on Ontario Roll, they felt that eventually he may have to move inside because it isn't 
blazing speed. But nevertheless, I've seen Ronnie Lott move inside and do okay. I've seen Rod Woodson move inside and do okay. And, uh, and I saw that Corey Chavis. The, 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 Corey Chavis. Does, does Ty Law have blazing speed? He's a great corner. This guy, I think, it fits the mold of someone like Ty Law. He's stocky, he's built, he's strong, he can run, he can jam you. So I don't think, I don't want to put too much emphasis on the speed. This guy's a football player. Right. That's what Arizona got. They got a football player. And another family picture up there. We might as well just put this out there right now, all right? We talked about these three corners. So with the sixth pick, Tennessee took shake. And that would be Pac-Man Jones. With the nine pick, could Washington take rattle? which would be Carlos Rogers. We do know that with that last pick, Arizona took roll. Antoine roll. Shake, rattle, and roll in the top 10 or 11. And Aaron Rodgers, where will he go? Washington, Detroit, Dallas, San Diego coming up. Welcome back to New York. Two hours into the 2005 NFL Draft. A lot of questions have been answered as we check out the Mazda Draft Track. Alex Smith goes number one overall. Three running backs go in the top five, first time ever in the common draft. Ronnie Brown, Cedric Benson, Cadillac Williams all off the board. The first wide receiver taken, Raylan Edwards, goes to Cleveland. Still waiting and still on the board is Aaron Rodgers. He's waiting here in New York City in the green room. Mike Williams, the wide receiver who hasn't played football in 15 months, is waiting in Tampa Bay. So lots of drama as we send it over to the cold pizza roundtable with Andrea Kramer. Thanks very much, Susie, along with John Jansen, uh, with the Redskins having acquired, in addition to, to this pick, number 25, there was some news that came out that they were interested in Auburn quarterback Jason Campbell. And at that point, the damage control started. How did that information leak out as, they were going to, as if they were going to launch an investigation? But how did that potential news that they would want a quarterback, how did that resonate amongst the players? Well, there's obviously, you know, whenever something like that leaks out, first of all, I don't think anything at, at this point of, of time is is a secret or an accident so you know there's things that you know people mislead different things here and there but you know in in the locker room obviously at first there was a little bit of shock we've got three good quarterbacks we've got Patrick who's coming into his fourth year Patrick Ramsey. Uh, and and we just you know there was a little bit of a shock but when you sit down and look at it and the way Patrick handled it was terrific he said hey this is my team this is my position I'm gonna lead this team uh, to, to playoffs and great things I'm not worried about it. if they want to bring somebody in who's gonna compete with me make me better make our team better I'm fine with that and, and that's how he's handled it and I think it's gonna be a, a great addition to the team if that happens you've been around Redskin Park all the time in the offseason conditioning program what is the sense as to what they could use at this pick here well I think uh, you know there's a lot of things that we can use I think one of the things that's really gonna help us out is 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 maybe another receiver we've got some guys David Patton Santana Moss that can really stretch the field Mike Williams is still on the board uh, he could really add a lot of size to that position obviously that's what everybody's talking about in our offense you know we need a guy that we can throw and, and, and get possession receivers to get first downs and uh, we'll take whoever they think is the best guy on the, on the board they're gonna probably take and right now you know in my book he may be the best guy there you and I sat here this time last year and we talked about the expectations with Joe Gibbs coming back and and really rebuilding this Redskin team what happened that you guys were only six and ten well there was there was a, a lot of things that happened obviously injuries uh, we had uh, LeVar went down I went down we had some key guys go down but another thing too is you know the coaches came in they were they were working on a, a 1992 offense and it's it's still a great offense but there was a learning curve as to the, the things that have changed in the NFL different blitzes different teams doing different things and it's just you know we have put in a lot of different wrinkles this year uh, we've addressed a lot of things with our offense and if we can play as, as well as our defense play we're, we're in for great things this year and I, and I really believe that this is going to be a big year for the Washington Redskins one player that's sitting out there is Antrell Roll the cornerback for Miami now you've got Santana Moss as you mentioned also Sean Taylor to Miami Miami guys there have been some some questionable issues with both of them how they're really fitting in in terms of team, team chemistry what could happen in terms of bringing in another guy what effect could that have well I think you know in terms of the two guys that are out that we have right now Santana you know it, it that situation is going to take care of itself. I think there's been a little bit of a misconception. There's a, there's a contract renegotiation going on, and I really think that'll take care of itself within the next week or two. Uh, in, in terms of Sean Taylor, you know, we have a lot of guys that are making the effort to be there in the offseason program. We need Sean to be there. We want him to be part of us. We want him to be part of our team. And, uh, you know, obviously it hurts that he's not around. 
Right now, we're just working on that situation, and we'll take it where it goes. I don't think we have to worry about Antrell Roll. I think he was just taken by the Cardinals. Let's head to Chris Berman. Okay, Andrea, John, thank you very much. So we will discuss the Redskins, who have a little under four minutes to go on the clock. Uh, the Washington Redskins, who, of course, are one of those teams like the Vikings with two first-round picks. But let's go backwards, because he got out in the kitchen and rattled them pots and pans. Antrell Roll means Susie Culber 11 straight years. At least one hurricane from Miami has gone in the first round. And how about that? 21 hurricanes since the year 2000. What is it about Miami? What do you learn there that, that makes you guys so adaptable to the NFL? I think just that competitive attitude. I mean, we compete at Miami on an everyday basis, no matter what it is. I mean, we're always competing. And we're always guiding each other in the right direction. So, I mean, I really do think that has a lot to do with it. All right. You say you're a self-professed mama's boy. Part of the reason that from Homestead, Florida, you went to Miami. What's this going to be like now across the country to Arizona? Uh, I mean, it's going to be great. As long as I'm playing the game, I mean, it's going to be great. I mean, I, I love to play the game. It doesn't matter where I am. I, I can be in Canada. As long as I'm playing the game, I'll be fine. I mean, my parents are going to be there every game. So, I mean, that's, that's going to... It's going to be something definitely I have to get used to, but I mean, it's going to be done. Your mom is known as a draft Nick. How does she compare to our Mel Kuyper? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there's an article down in, down in uh, Miami says that Mel Kuyper can't touch us, so I don't know how that goes. Well, speaking of can't touch in, in your division, Tori Holt, who's here today working for ESPN, how do you plan on defending guys like that, Pro Bowl wide receivers? Well, I mean... It's, it's going to be very interesting. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to have to watch a little film with him, try to get his ins and outs, try to steal a few of his weaknesses. But, I mean, it's going to be great. It's going to be a great battle. I'm going to really looking forward to it. Already working on Tory. Chris, back right. to you. <laughs> All right, Suze, natural congratulations. Uh, yeah, Miami Hurricanes, man, they, we've gotten to know them in the first round, yeah. haven't we? Well, <laughs> every year. Every, every year. Not as many this year, though. Antrell's going to be the last of the ones today. Okay. So it's not as many. We used to have three, four, five. Yep. Not today. Wow. The Washington Redskins have two first-round picks. This is a spot that maybe some teams uh, that Washington would like to get out of, and they're certainly going to take all 15 minutes, or they, or they would go down a little bit. Who would someone come up to get? Carlos Rogers, the last defensive back. Would that be somebody? Uh, we could see that the quarterback is not an issue right now. Is there a one guy sitting there that this might be a trade spot for, fellas? Well, listen, you, we haven't had any offensive linemen go off the, the board. And even though Alex Barron, the Florida State left tackle, has been on most boards the highest rated guy. I'm talking about most mock drafts. Jamal Brown of Oklahoma is a right tackle that a lot of teams like, and he's going to be going sometime, I think, in the next four or five picks. And if somebody's trading up, it might be to take a look at a Jamal. And the other guy that's been hot, we've been talking about him all week on ESPN.com and everywhere, is DeMarcus Ware, kid out of Troy. That's right. Everybody's kind of targeted him for Dallas at 11. Well, if you want to get ahead of Dallas at 11, you got to move up and get him. DeMarcus Ware is that combo hybrid defensive end outside linebacker out of Troy. You look at the best available players, Mike I want to say to Aaron Rodgers right now, I remember Dan Marino being the next to last pick in the first round. I remember talking to Boomer Siason. Boomer, you and I talked to Boomer back in 84. Yep. And he was sliding. The Bengals took three players in the first round. Ricky Hundley, Pete Koch, and Brian Blados. Then in the second round took Boomer Siason. The rest is history. Boomer went to a Super Bowl and almost won it. So for Aaron Rodgers, you have to wait a little while. Roethlisberger went 11th overall. He wasn't even off the board yet this time last year. Seems that Brett Favre was a second-round pick, too, Chris. How did he turn out? <laughs> Not bad. Pretty good. Pick is in. <laughs> Washington. First of two oh, in the quick. first round. That was real quick. <laughs> With the uh, ninth selection in the 2005 NFL Draft, the Washington Redskins select Carlos Rogers. That's correct. Cornerback Auburn. That's correct. There's Rattle. We got shake, we got roll, now we got rattle. He's a, there's some that say that he may, some have him rated the highest corner on their board. They do, and I think Mort said, hey, they're drafting for need. Teams now are specifying what we have to have, and they have to have a corner and a wide receiver. And cornerback, obviously, with Fred Smoot now a Minnesota Viking, a priority. You look at Carlos Rogers, six foot and change, 195, ran a 4-4-4 at the combine, vertical 40 and a half inches, and he eliminated. I'll tell you, the Auburn coaches said that there was only about 20 percent of the pass plays went after Carlos Rogers. Teams 
this year avoided his side of the field because he basically at the college level eliminated half the field and did a heck of a job. You could argue he was the most steady and most reliable corner in the country this season. He earned the right after maybe being a second round pick going into the year. He earned the right to be a top 10 pick. Now three cornerbacks off the board. Great opportunity for Rodgers in Washington. Sean Springs and no Fred Smoot. Great opportunity to start. Torrey Holt, I want to ask you. Shutdown corner, I say it doesn't exist. I say it's a term nobody should ever use again. Is there any cornerback in the NFL right now that can negate Torrey Holt in any game? It's, it's, it's tough to hold, hold a receiver nowadays, a good receiver nowadays, to no catches. Shutdown corner, I think we need to just go and sweep that under. With all the formations that these offensive coordinators can create now, the movements, the shifts, it's kind of tough to say I got a shutdown corner on my football team now. Have some good corners. Carlos Rogers is the one. I think he's very tough. And what I like about him, he's strong to the uh, to the ball. As far as hitting, coming up on the run, he reminds me of Winfield, Tony Winfield from the Minnesota Vikings. Just back to Aaron Rodgers, the Cal quarterback, is waiting back in the green room right now. And Mel, you mentioned it, the, the NFL is now a need draft. It's become a need draft. And that's because of free agency. And so the days of six quarterbacks taken in the first round, like it happened in 1983, headed by John Elway, is not going to happen anymore because teams address needs more often than not in today's draft. So the Redskins have made their first of two picks. By the way, Three, it never had three Auburn players go in the first round period. How about three in the first nine? Think they were any good last year? Detroit, Dallas, San Diego. Could it be a defensive run? We'll be back. Yeah, running down the dream. We are back in New York and Detroit has wasted no time as they have the 10th overall pick. The Detroit Lions have set the card up. Lions on the move. Here's proof. They made the pick in two minutes. With the 10th uh, selection in the 2005 NFL draft, the Detroit Lions select Mike Williams, wide receiver, USC. been this is the Lions draft party in the stadium where I mean maybe the Colts have the second best passing attack I don't know I mean last year Roy Williams was a stud Charles Rogers who was picked number one the year before we've never really seen him and he still has injury problems and now here's Mike Williams who hasn't played for a year now if you ever get them all on the field at the same time the excuses are over for Joey Harrington, That's okay? Right. Can I make it clear? They are definitely over for Joey wow, Harrington, this is I'll tell surprise. you. It is, because you had Rodgers, you had Roy Williams, now you go three straight years for wideouts, but hey, if I'm picking it then, I got the number one player on my board, I'm taking him, and I think you look at Mike Williams, I tell you what, compare Mike Williams to Braylon Edwards. They say, hey, Mike Williams can't run, he can't separate. Mike Williams' career average, when he was 18, 19 years of age at USC, was 14.7 yards. Braylon Edwards at Michigan, 14.1 yards. Brett says, well, Kerry Colbert was great. Mike Williams is average. Kerry Colbert in 2003 had 69 catches and nine touchdowns. Mike Williams that same year had 95 catches and 16 touchdowns. So I'll tell you what, people are taking shots at Mike Williams, criticizing Mike Williams. I never saw it. Obviously, Matt Millen and Steve Mariucci felt like value. It's the first time we ever said that word today. Best value pick so far, Mike Williams. Didn't make sense from a need standpoint. They need a defensive end. They need a right tackle board from a value standpoint best pick so far. I mean, look, obviously they stayed look. true to their board, but remember now, Carlos Rogers, I mean, uh, Roy Williams and, and, and Rogers, the other wide receiver, they're speed guys, and they also have injury concerns, so he would be a compliment to the speed they've added, and I like what Chris said, Joey Harrington may not have any more excuses. Does this tell us anything about Charles Rogers? What type of condition is he in? We're not great. expect from a durability standpoint. A boom. Well, well, we'll see. Not great. We'll see. He, he, with that pick there, this this could be his last leg. With, with them bringing in Mike Williams, but if they can get all three of those guys on the field at the same time, that's a very tough offensive football team. Former teammate of yours now Ooh. may have a little tough time getting the ball, and that's Azakim. But 
<laughs> yeah, it, it, it sends a message out to Oz Akeem as well. And like you said, boom, Joey Harrington, you better get it done. Well, and if he doesn't, they have Jeff Garcia, who yep. has won at every level he's been at. You know, I, I and, and and Jeff will get in there if, if Joey does. So look, the Lions are clearly pushing the envelope on offense. This is clearly a team on the move. They finally won road games last year after three straight years of not winning on the road. This is a team that you may see go from the, you know, the six and ten ranks into the playoffs as a wild card team. I, you just. But boy, have they stacked it with wide receivers. So let's go back a step with Washington, please. And through our Coors Light video conferencing, we welcome in the head coach of the Redskins, Joe Gibbs. Joe, what's the second year of the NFL draft like for you as compared to the first? What's the process like? I think uh, on both of them, you're excited. I think I am. And uh, you're looking for you know, adding, adding quality players to your football team. Certainly we think we've done this here. Um, and so I think you're excited as a coach. You're looking for, hey, somebody that can come in and help you get into the playoffs and uh, ways to strengthen your football team. So I get excited about it. What impressed you about Carlos Rogers, cornerback from Auburn? Uh, probably what didn't impress us. I think he's uh, a shutdown corner. We think he's also physical. Uh, he's had a great career. He's been super productive, and I think he fits in great for us. There's another pick coming for you guys in the first round. Defense wasn't really so much an issue last year as offense. What's the plan? Well, I think we're, we've got a number of players that we've got that we think would fit with our football team at that pick, 25, and so we're just going to uh, take the best player that we think fits in for our football team. Joe, thanks. We'll see you later in the first round. You bet. The 2005 NFL Draft rolls on from New York City. They're getting ready in Dallas. Bill Parcells, Jerry Jones, working the phones. ESPN's exclusive coverage of the NFL Draft is presented by Coors Light, the official beer sponsor of the NFL. And in part by the all-new midsize H3 in dealership soon. Welcome back to the Jacob Javits Center in New York. And now maybe the pass rushers come on the draft, like Sean Merriman from Maryland, or the big guy, Marcus Spears from LSU, or an unbelievably productive college player at Georgia, the much decorated David Pollock, or Demarcus Ware and Mel Kuyper. Now, I mean, Detroit jumped the gun. I, I really thought they'd go D. That's going to be... That's going to be one of the more intriguing picks as we go forward, just staying true to your board and a draft philosophy in Mike Williams. But now it's time, maybe, and Dallas has made no bones about it. Let's get bigger on defense. Let's press the issue. There's five hybrids. There's combo defensive end, outside linebackers. Talk about Peter Bulware, Charles Haley. This goes on and on. Mike Rabels, guys like that. And I think you look at Demarcus Ware. Certainly you look at a Dan Cody from Oklahoma, Sean Merriman from Maryland. Look at a Matt Roth from Iowa and a David Pollock from Georgia. Five kids who can play on their feet or down. Give you a pass rush. Give you the ability like Rabel and Bruski, defensive linemen, turn line backer and another combo guy only more of a safety as well as an outside backer Thomas Davis out of Georgia so a lot of versatile kids figure to come off the board fairly soon so Dallas picking now with the 11th pick Dallas picks with the 20th overall pick so they one of those four teams with two picks in the first round Ed Werder is in Dallas good afternoon Ed Hello, Boomer, and I think the Cowboys are going to try to make a coordinated strike here with their 11 and 20 picks. Things could not have gone better for this team with the first 10 choices because no front seven players on defense are off the board, and that's where the Cowboys intend to concentrate their first round picks. Bill Parcells wants to get bigger on defense. He wants to get a pass rusher. The question now becomes Marcus Spears, the big defensive end from LSU. He's a better pass rusher in Parcells' opinion than those of others around the country. He could play in a 3-4 or he could play in a 4-3. Uh, Sean Merriman, outside linebacker at Maryland. They see him as an outside linebacker in a 3-4. And they also see Demarcus Ware from Troy, one of the leading pass rushers in the country, as a guy who goes from his hand on the ground to outside linebacker. So what you're going to see here, I think the Cowboys are going to pick one of these players, and then they're going to come back from 20 and try and pick up one of the others. The problem for them, Boomer, is they've got a lot of teams picking right behind them, a minefield of teams, San Diego, Houston, Kansas City, and Cincinnati, all of whom could take a pass rusher or a defensive end. 
Well, Ed, that's it. their best bet if they're trying to get the two is to take Merriman or Ware here and hope that Spears is at 20. Let's see what they do with number 11. The pick is up. With the 11th selection in the 2005 NFL Draft, the Dallas Cowboys select DeMarcus Ware, defensive end, Troy State. Now, Troy is an unusual place for a guy picked in the 11, number 11 overall, Mel. Go back to the New England Patriots when Bill Parcells was a head coach. His first overall pick, I believe fourth in the first round, was Willie McGinnis. And you see DeMarcus Ware, that combo guy like Willie McGinnis was coming out of USC for Parcells up in New England. You look at DeMarcus Ware, he played two years of high school football, yet even early on at Troy, he was a sack artist, got so much attention from the offensive line and the blocking scheme, double and triple team, yet he still posted Posted pretty good numbers. 29 quarterback hurries this past season. Tall, rangy. And you talk about intangibles for a quarterback. Everybody I talked to in the NFL said, hey, this kid has the work ethic and all the intangibles you want in a defensive end who comes in the league ready to learn, ready to work, and ready to hustle for you. And certainly when you go back to Charles Haley types and you look at a Willie McGinnis type, that's what LaBarcus Ware gives a Cowboy team who opposite Greg Ellis have nobody at that other defensive end spot. You mentioned tall and rangy. You mentioned Willie McGinnis. You ought to also mention Lawrence Taylor. That was Bill Parcells' greatest player on those two Super Bowl champion New York Giants football teams. And all I can tell you is, certainly he's thinking about a hybrid guy and that where can, in fact, stand up when he needs them to stand up. Well, one thing that Bill certainly, and he took over and made the playoffs his first year in Dallas, and then last year went back to 6-10 and 10 because defensively, yeah, he's a big defensive type guy. They had a small defense, which Bigger was very productive when he got there, but you can see from 03 to 04 the difference in defense, and that'll make you know, our one-time compatriot Bill Parcells scratch his head. Aaron Rodgers wondering when his day will come. It's coming soon. I'm mean, going to guess it's not going to be next with San Diego. We'll be back. <laughs>